Hello everyone and welcome to the New South Wales EdTech Dialogue Summit. I'm Sarah Lamont, the Program Coordinator at EduGrowth and I'll be MC for today's program. For those who, who are just being introduced to EduGrowth, we are Australia's education, technology and innovation industry hub. Through connection and collaboration, we are accelerating Australia's EdTech ecosystem globally. On behalf of EduGrowth, I am delighted to especially welcome uh, all delegates joining us from India today. Um, we are so looking forward to a program of thought-provoking discussions um, from both Indian and New South Wales SORT leaders, um, and also looking forward to a showcase of the high-quality capability of New South Wales EdTech. Allow me to begin today's proceedings by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we gather on. For those joining us internationally, we start every event in Australia with an acknowledgement of country as an important step towards reconciliation with Australia's first peoples. As we gather today physically dispersed but virtually connected, I acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia and recognise their continuous and unbroken connection to land, waters and culture across the country. Today I join you from the traditional land of the Bidigal people of the Eora Nation. I extend all our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. And I especially welcome uh, any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are present with us today. So today's summit is part of Investment New South Wales Going Global EdTech to India series, designed to connect New South Wales and Indian EdTech ecosystems. Programs like this are only possible with great partners. The support of Investment New South Wales <clears throat> has been invaluable. Uh, thanks to the team, Tim, Melanie and Lynn. Uh, we also have a partnership with, with uh, India's India Didactics Association. So thanks, Aditya and Ashmi. With that, I would like to welcome to stage Tim Martin, the lead for India and Middle East from Investment New South Wales, to officially welcome you all to today's program. Once again, the support of Investment New South Wales has brought this program to fruition and we are very thankful for the partnership. So mm. hi, Tim. Hello, Sarah, and uh, hello, everybody, and namaste from Sydney, New South Wales. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land where I am today, the Boragegal and Tamaragal people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who have joined us today. So thank you, Sarah. Um, as, as Sarah mentioned, my name is Tim Martin. I work for Investment New South Wales and lead the state government's projects and engagement across India and the Middle East. As some of you might know, Investment New South Wales is the state government's trade, investment and education promotion agency. We have a trade office in Mumbai and we're currently growing our team, which is ably led by Ms. Malini Dutt, who you will be hearing from a little bit later. As part of our work in India, the New South Wales government is rolling out the Going Global program across a number of different sectors and different global markets. EdTech to India is one of the 15 such programs we're delivering. The ultimate objective of the state's investment into this program is the development of introductions and new business with Indian partners like yourselves. But we're not working alone here, and I'm so pleased to be working alongside EduGrowth to deliver this program. Uh, EduGrowth are the Australian peak body for the EdTech sector, and David and Sarah from EduGrowth have done a tremendous job, and we're thrilled to be working with them. But I'd also like to extend thanks to the India Didactics Association. Uh, without them, we would not have been able to put on such a, a big event as we are today. So thanks so much to the team at IDA. Thank you also to our partners at Austrade, uh, Monica Kennedy, the Austrade's Senior Trading Investment Commissioner, and the wonderful Neha Grover, Austrade's uh, Director of Education based in Delhi, for their support today as well. Um, can I also give a huge shout out to the New South Wales EdTech firms who are here today to showcase their solutions and who have shown such enthusiasm for this program. We're really excited to hear from you later on today. So I'll finish there, but would like to wish everyone who's joined us today a very productive summit. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tim. 
Um, now with that, I'll get into the agenda for today's program. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to the right of your screens where we have a schedule lined up for um, the day today. Uh, so we'll start off uh, today with a showcase of 11 innovative ed tech companies. They'll all be across the K-12, higher education and workforce sectors, all with solutions poised to enhance the experience and outcomes of your learners. We also have three thought leadership in conversations today, which we are so excited about. Uh, the first will focus on the K-12 sector with a Mr. Shalindra Sharma, the president advisor to the director of education from the government of Delhi. We'll also have a Mr. Robin Kishore, uh, program lead education policy and administration from the deputy chief's minister's office, also from the government of, uh, of Delhi, and Mark Greentree, the director of technology for learning from the New South Wales Department of Education. Uh, the discussion will unpack digital models for maximizing student outcomes. Then we're gonna switch focus to the higher education sector with a discussion on innovation in the institution. Uh, we are delighted to host Professor, Professor Dr. Raj Singh, the Vice Chancellor of Jane uh, to be deemed university and Merlin Crossley, Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic at the University of New South Wales. Then to finish the program, we will spotlight New South Wales at the forefront of EdTech innovation. Uh, we are honored to host uh, Monica Kennedy, the Senior Trade and Investment Commissioner of Mumbai um, at Austrade. Melanie Dutt, the Director of Trade and Investment in India from Investment New South Wales, and uh, Srinvas Rao uh, McNeil from uh, the CEO at T Hub. Please check out the um, agenda again if you want uh, the timings that are specific to your region. Uh, so, what today? What makes today's program really exciting is the virtual expo hall. So after each block of showcases, attendees are invited to drop into the expo booths of participating companies. Um, in those booths, companies will host a full demonstration of their solution and answer any questions you have on their offering. Uh, so um, after each company presents, you'll receive a prompt for myself to move to their expo booth within the trade hall. And I believe we're showing an image now for you so this is what the virtual trade hall looks like. And you'll just press the um, expo booth with a little flag is uh, to join there. Then when you select the booth you'd like to visit, um, you can then press join to watch the live session demo. Um, and what that will look like is on the next slide, uh, we'll have there to start the live session to, to join there and listen into our, uh, um, to our companies. So with that, um, let's kick off with the first showcase block. Uh, I would like to first invite Peter Carpenter, the APAC Director of WAND, to uh, speak to us for a few moments. Thanks, Sarah. I'll, Hi, Peter. Uh, jump straight into it, if you like. Yeah, absolutely. We'll just uh, make sure your slides are up. Perfect. You're good to go. And uh, time starts now. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, or morning, everyone, from depending where you're coming from. Um, I'm, as Sarah mentioned, I'm the Peter Carpenter, the APAC Director for WAND. Um, as a quick overview, uh, one of the key challenges for schools around data management is basically controlling which, which companies and, and who and when can access their data. In 2015, WAND built a, a solution to overcome this. Basically, our platform enables schools to control exactly as I mentioned, uh, which applications and who can access their data in what stage. What a lot of schools do these days at the moment or have done in the past uh, pre-WAND is having to update third-party applications using manual uploads of CSV files, manually updating accounts every term when new students arrive or at the start of the year, um, and without any real controllers to um, the synchronization of data with their third-party applications. For the EdTech apps um, that we work with, uh, basically, data security um, is one of the key aspects that they're facing on a on a day to day basis as as they expand to more and more schools. Um, and by using Wand and connecting with Wand, they integrate with Wand's API once and can access over twenty three thousand schools globally that Wand works with. They no longer need to to spend the time performing manual integrations themselves or receiving what can be hundreds of CSV files uh, from their schools to then manually upload. Uh, one secure API provides an automated sync from the so school's source of truth, which is generally their, their student information system, uh, and populates their products uh, instantaneously. 
As a quick bit of background for WANT, uh, we work, as I mentioned, with 20 odd, 23,000 schools globally. Uh, we work with, uh, integrate with about 35 different student information systems or, or government data hubs, uh, many of those across Australia. Um, we obviously support with 400 different applications that um, connect to WAND and enable us to support their business, uh, operating in just over 60, 60 countries uh, with 90 plus different um, ICT or support services and support partners. Um, and we have offices in four countries supporting our schools globally. In terms of how one works, um, basically there's three components. There's the school and their student information system or their source of truth in terms of data, which obviously they control. One then sits in the middle of that and draws data from the school's system and takes a, holds an instance of that data, enabling then the third party applications to, to sync with our API. Now this entire process, as you can imagine, is centrally controlled by the school. So they choose which third-party applications they'll allow to access uh, their data and exactly what data they'll be consuming themselves, obviously all based around the type of product that they are and what they need. Uh, how it works for schools. Um, so in terms of uh, request process kicks things off. So from the applications perspective, so that's, that's, that's the mass products. They may need to access the students' names, classes, and perhaps teacher detail, the teacher names and emails. They send a request from their one portal um, to the school of their choice in order to connect. The school then can access that request within their one portal, understand what data they're wanting to access, and then be able to approve um, the specific data fields. Once that integration of that approval takes place, that's the integration complete. So it's extremely straightforward. Um, schools based upon, um, they can basically get their integrations uh, and connections set up and working with one within the hour for the third party applications that they use. Uh, just quickly in terms of how we support schools, um, obviously security and reliability is critical. Um, and obviously, it's, as I mentioned, only applications that the schools use um, are the ones that they obviously are approving. So it's not uh, any other application they've never heard of. It's only the, the applications they're obviously using to remove that manual process of, of having to update via CSV files. Uh, in terms of control and visibility, they have one platform. So their one portal enables them to then manage, as I mentioned, all the various applications they use. And our enterprise portal provides jurisdictions like state governments, as an example, uh, the ability to have uh, visibility across all their schools, know exactly which applications the schools are using, what data is being um, approved to be accessed, uh, and they can actually can control that for all their schools if they so wish. In terms of ease and adoption and use, um, based as I mentioned, it can be integrated and set up within the hour. So we have schools, uh, we bring on hundreds of schools every term um, and can able to set those up uh, within a uh, school up within the hour to be uh, approving and providing data to their chosen third party applications. Perfect. Now, Peter, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to cut you off there, but that does sound fascinating. So no if, uh, if anyone wants to find out more about WAND, they can head over to uh, Peter's expo booth in the balloon trade hall. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, cheers. And I think uh, we have Patrick up next. Um, and I think we've got your slides ready now, Patrick. Oh, sorry. We'll get you back on screen there. Hello. Sorry. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Um, sounds good. So uh, Patrick McGrath from ClickView will hand over to you to present. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sarah. And hello, everyone. Um, I hope you're all having a wonderful morning so far. Um, I am presenting on behalf of ClickView. Um, given I've got three minutes, to make this as useful for you as I possibly can, I'll just give you a quick overview about what ClickView is. And on top of that, some of the key areas that we try and help schools in to give you an idea of what you might be interested in and if it's something you might want to explore further. So at a high level, ClickView is a video learning platform. Think of it as a blend between a Netflix and Amazon Prime, where we've got a large amount of video content, except unlike Netflix and Amazon Prime, our content is educational based, as well as a teaching and learning resource. So having other materials or other functionality to try and enhance the way that schools use video in the classroom. I'll go through four high level things that ClickView does to try and support schools. And if anything jumps out to you that you think that might be something I'd like to explore further, that's something that might be interesting to me, or that's something that I feel like connects with something I'm looking for, then feel free to drop by our booth and, and have a quick chat to us. 
So the four ways that we try and support schools are first of all, by being a content library of world-class educational video content. One of the biggest difficulties that we run into often when we think about video learning is how to license, curate, and have a large amount of global educational video content that's available anywhere in the world and of a high level. So ClickView curates uh, content from a range of global providers, as well as creating content ourselves that is designed specifically with an educational slant in mind, designed to be short, sharp, and engaging for students and for teachers, and with age relevance in mind. If you're wanting a clip for a grade five student or a year 12 student, the content will be designed with those students' age, ages and educational levels in mind. Um, in terms of teaching and learning capabilities, we try and support schools through a number of ways. Number one, by making any, of the, any video interactive so that students can actually interact and engage with it, uh, whether that's for a class discussion, for a homework assignment, trying to make it something to remove that passive learning thing that video often runs into. Anything can be clipped. You can take a, a full feature length film sort of video and clip it down into a range of two minute segments. You can chop and change and edit things all within the platform to make it nice and easy. There are a range of other lesson plans and additional resources that can be used so that the video doesn't just stand alone. It becomes part of the learning experience and we integrate with all major learning platforms and, uh, and other sort of apps so that if you're wanting the, the video to run seamlessly with the rest of your class through a Google Classrooms, through Microsoft Teams, something like that on a, on a canvas or a blackboard, you can do all of that within the platform and have it a seamless experience for your school. Um, everything that we do on the platform is tracked and it, as a teacher or as, a, as an institution, you have access to all of those analytics, how well students are performing on different things, um, how well they've, or what they're looking, what they're engaging with, how much is, is being done, it's a really nice way to help with data-informed teaching practices, with making sure that the content you're teaching or that you're sending to students is relevant, and just making sure that at any point in time, if you're needing to split students up so that you want to share different content to different levels of students, that you can make it targeted and relevant for them. Um, and finally, the platform can also be used to host and share your own content. So if the school has a bank of content that you're wanting to put online, if the students are doing sort of, uh, video learning tasks and you don't want to put it on somewhere that's public like YouTube, or if you're just wanting to save a lot of content for yourself and still have access to all of the data analytics and other information that you can use or integrate personal content as a part of a, a canvas or a blackboard, all of that can be done through the platform. And it's a really nice way of also saving key content for the school over a number of years to avoid losing specific video content as teachers come and go. Um, these are just a few nice clips of the platform, some of the resources, what some of those interactives look like. Being able to separate all the students into class is a really nice function. And of course, a really easy way to share, whether through an integration or a simple click link to just embed uh, somewhere like a lesson plan for the students to use. If you're interested, a few things to keep in mind are that number one, we are concept rather than curriculum specific focused. It's just a really nice way of making sure that regardless of what curriculum the students are on, it's aimed at just educational concepts and educational ideas. We will build curriculum mapping into the platform uh, in the coming months. But for now, it's all broken down based on student age level and what sort of concepts or what educational principles they might be learning. Fantastic, if anyone here is Patrick. interested, you can request a free demo account for us. And we are a school wide subscription as well. Um, as opposed to just an individual. Uh, I'll jump over to the booth and if you're interested, drop us a line and we'll give you all a free account if you'd like. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Patrick. Um, very well timed. And now I'd like to welcome to stage Mark Stanley, uh, the CEO and founder of Literatu. Hi there, Mark. We've got your slides ready, fantastic. Um, hand over to you. Oh, sorry, Mark, I believe you're on mute, mute actually. Oops, let's, let me just put that off for a moment. Must have. Uh... Sorry, Mark, let's try that one more time. I think you had your slides up. If you want to try one more time. Yes, let's start sharing. See how we go. We had them on just perfectly before. Yeah, it should be on now, right? Uh, yep, so if you want to just select the presentation now to share and full screen that. Now, okay. Here we go. 
All right, Mark, we're just about ready to go. Let's see if we can get this. There we go. Great. Okay, we're off. Fantastic. Good. Good morning, everybody. Sorry for the little uh, technical glitch. I'm Mark Stanley. I'm from Literatu. So what we do is we use AI to help students and teachers build strong English writing skills, and we do it at scale. So currently we have over 420,000 users across 400 schools and we work in 12 countries. The current problem, I think, and we see it all the time, is that English teaching resources just can't accelerate to the level they need to to support the global demand for English writing. Uh, and it's English everything, really. We've got loads of learners coming through the, the, the systems every year and we need 69 million more teachers. So that big problem really cascades down to individual little problems, you know, at country, school, college, class level, where writing is not only the most difficult, but it's the most important skill for students to learn, and it's the hardest one for teachers to teach. So out of all this problem, you know, that all these problems that we have, students really simply want better access to faster writing support, more personalised feedback, and, of course, great results. Teachers just simply want to save time, reduce the hours they spend. They want to lift the levels of personalization they can get to with students, and they want to be the best teacher ever. It's, it's those three things that come through our research all the time. So we put a really simple place, a, a platform in place, a smart AI working system that takes student text, puts it through the Scribo AI engine, and delivers the personalized feedback and results everyone's looking for. So we do more than just grammar, punctuation and spelling. You know, that's just part of writing. So we guide people with scaffolds. We build writing skills alongside the writing that's been done. Our feedback is personalised. Scoring is instant and explained. So, you know, all of those sort of manual tasks that teachers spend hours on are all catered for in the, in the platform. The actionable feedback is tailored to the student's native language, if you want, and it's a direct feedback for each student with customised context help that goes to help mentor the student through the writing process. So teachers can engage, students can engage, uh, data powers everything, and it's really um, a very capable platform to get deployed very quickly. So we've been working for a few years now on how to get students connected really quickly. We onboard them instantly. We have teachers running within an hour and we can improve writing gains within a week. So we work across the globe. We work across a lot of countries and our focus is really around assessment support for students and teachers and schools. We're starting to move right across the Asian EMEA and MENA regions um, where there's, there's more and more web access coming online. And, and in those regions, we work with customers and partners in really practical ways. We work with the British Council, for example, in a B2C model. We work with colleges and universities in a B2B2C model. So we're very adaptive as to how we work with partners and integrate into their platforms using all the different techniques that we, we can. Our pricing is flexible as well. We, we work on demand and the premium levels and we, we target the services that people want to deliver through our platform uh, to meet their need. Our customers love us. We have thousands and thousands of, of, um, of great uh, references and we do a heck of a lot of word checking. So our AI gets smarter every time someone uses it. We have a really experienced team behind Literatu that's used to working with partners in diverse countries and situations. And really, you know, every day we stick to our mission. We elevate the storytellers of today and we want to coach the storytellers of tomorrow. So join us on the right writing journey. And uh, well, I look forward to seeing you in the booth. And thank you, Sarah, back to you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, and as Mark said, you can go have a chat to Literatu in just a few moments. Uh, so next, I'd like to welcome our uh, final showcase for this first block, which is Sadeep Nair, uh, the CEO, CEO and founder of iCode Next. Perfect. And I think you're on mute there, Sadeep. So if you just want to switch your... And we'll just check that your audio is uh, back on. Is it fine? Perfect. We're, we're good Thank to go. So We've got your slides. I'll hand over to you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to meet you all. I'm going to start by sharing a small story with you. I come from India, and I come from a generation of 90s, where there was a huge rush to learn computer programming. 
It was something new, but people realized that it's the future. Today, India is a superpower in the world of software development. In 2016, when my son was nine years old, me and my wife decided to start teaching him programming because we believe that if you want to master something, you have to start early. Unfortunately, at that time, we couldn't find any high quality coding institute for young children. And that's how iCodeNext came into existence. Fast forward, here is our son in 2020 with his principal, vice principal, and with his teacher. He has published four books on coding at the age of 14, which you can find on Amazon. Here are some of our other children who are learning advanced programming like mobile app, web page development, Python, and they are just in grade four, five, and six. We are very proud to say that they are four to five years ahead from any other children in their age group. We have been teaching children programming in Australian schools during the last six years from kindergarten to year 12. All our program courses are based on Australian digital curriculum and all our activities incorporate STEM education. I will run a small video which showcase the features and benefit of this great program. iCode Next is a pioneer in the development of digital technology courses for K-12 and has been at the forefront of delivering courses to students in Australian public and private schools since 2016. To make it easier for teachers to teach students technology courses, in 2019, we launched an online digital platform called CodyBlock. This is a platform where students can learn coding, as well as practice computational and systems thinking and understand technology. CodyBlock is a fantastic one-stop, fully integrated STEM lesson platform for schools, teachers, and students. It has many great features, including a grade and age-based curriculum for K-12, scaffolded curriculum design, dashboard for principals and teachers to monitor school and individual student progress, the dashboard for parents to monitor their child's progress, lessons which all include instructional videos, library management for teachers, 1000 plus interactive quizzes, teacher training and certification, robotics, and lessons which cover multiple platforms and programming languages, and much, much more. Fantastic. Thank you so much, um, Sadiq. That does bring us to time. Um, what I would like to do once again is invite uh, anyone watching who would like to connect with Wand, ClickView, Literatu, or iCode Next to please uh, head to the expo booth at the Tray Hall for a product demonstration. Um, otherwise, if you are sticking around, uh, we're about to kick off our first in conversation. Um, when with that, uh, I'd like to uh, invite everyone to use the chat box uh, on the right of screen to ask any questions of our speakers um, while they're in conversation. So uh, it's my pleasure to welcome the facilitator for today's discussion, Delvine Nielsen. Uh, Delvine is the head of customer success at ClickView. In her previous role, she was a Director of Sales and Customer Enablement at 3P Learning. Uh, she's also an experienced educator, passionate about providing quality learning experiences for students. So welcome, Delvine. Thank you so much, Sarah. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to facilitate this discussion. Fantastic. Well, I'll hand over. Excellent. Well, it's my pleasure today to be facilitating um, an amazing conversation, obviously around the digital models for um, really maximising student outcomes in what has been an accelerated growth in online learning um, and obviously hybrid models of learning to really ensure that students are engaged um, and maximising their performance. So it is my pleasure to welcome um, a number of people that are going to engage and share some really valuable insights um, today. So first off, we have Abhimanyu Basu, who is the Dean and CEO um, of Dhirubhai Abani International School. 
um, and responsible and has so much experience as an educator um, to also share his insights into this really, really topical um, subject for all of us. Um, alongside Abhimanyu, we will welcome Mr. Robin uh, Kishore, who is also the program lead in education policy and administration for the Deputy Chief Minister's Office for the Government of Delhi. Um, and we will also welcome Mark Greentree, who is the Acting Executive Director for Digital Learning for New South Wales Department of Education um, and has been involved in this past number of years, uh, both as a principal and in his first role in the annual delivery um, of technology to enhance learning in a online and hybrid model. So welcome to the three of you. I'm really excited um, to learn more from all of you. So I guess, um, first of all, Mark, I might um, sort of kick off with you first and foremost, um, just with, I guess, an opening question is, sort of what's been the model and framework that you've adopted um, with the New South Wales Department um, that's really maximised um, online learning for all of the teachers and students um, in your environment? Thanks, Dilvi. Um, Look, I, I guess to answer that question, I might, I might jump back a little bit in time and go to our first COVID lockdown in 2020, uh, because that's really when um, education in New South Wales took a significant and fundamental shift from a model that's been in place for about 150 years to uh, a remote online learning scenario overnight. Uh, essentially, we needed to get devices out to schools uh, because our state is quite significant in size. Uh, we're the second largest educational jurisdiction in the world. Um, uh, parts of our area are actually on different time zones, in fact. Um, so getting devices out to schools, getting dongles with a priority for students in years 11 and 12, um, so that they were targeted not to, not to, I guess, risk their final year and, and the most probably the most important year in their education. Uh, then it was about trying to build that confidence and that level of efficacy of teachers to be able to deliver in an online learning mode. So in order to do that, we ran a significant number of, of webinars. Over, over 20 days, we ran something like 100, 120 webinars uh, with a lot of Q&A wrapped around online learning platforms um, like your Microsoft Teams, Google, um, Zoom, um, how to actually engage with students and how to build um, digital tools and digital uh, materials for students to learn. Uh, we also ran some uh, parent webinars as well to try and support the parents uh, in being able to support their child and engage because at the end of the day, the parents weren't the teachers. They were simply, I guess, the, the supporting uh, cast that were going to assist with the learning from home. And then the final piece was about putting high quality curriculum aligned uh, content that was easily able to be accessed by students, parents and teachers uh, in a way that didn't really require a significant amount of um, instruction, but would enable the students and the parents to engage with the activities themselves uh, with an opportunity then for the teachers to be able to extend on that within their classroom experience. So we built on that experience in 2020. We thought we said goodbye to, uh, to COVID at the end of 2020 and then bam, we got it again in 2021. So we simply just built off the back of that. And I think we took it to the next level then. We were able to drive out much faster logistics to get devices where they needed to go. Uh, and we even uplifted and ramped up the uh, the quality of our internet services out in particularly some of our country areas where we've, we've put in a considerable amount, $300 million worth of investment to drive uh, much better internet services out there. So a lot of work in the back, but um, I think at the end, quite a successful outcome for all our students and teachers. Fantastic, Mark. We'll, we'll definitely come back to you for a few further questions, but thanks for that um, You know, amazing overview and obviously pivoting very quickly to support students um, and schools in this very challenging time. Um, I might cross over to you, Abhimanyu. Just, I know you're in a very um, interesting environment, obviously leading a, a very large school. So can you talk to me a little bit about how you're working towards making the hybrid learning experience for both educators and students really seamless? And talk to us a bit about that model and, and the challenges that you're facing and overcoming. Yeah, so, um, you know, currently uh, in Mumbai, as I said, we have permission to get children from grades 8 to 12 uh, into school. And I think we just have received confirmation today that grades 1 to 7 can start coming back from tomorrow. Uh, into school in Maharashtra. Uh, so uh, in India, education is a state subject and, and these decisions in terms of when the children get back to school are taken by the government, local government. 
Um, so uh, as we came back uh, to school, the first thing was that we would follow the guidelines which were given by the government, which is the children would come back with parent permission only. And we had 95% parents who gave permission to children to come back to school. We are a school of 1,100. Uh, I also oversee Reliance Foundation Schools, which has got about 15,000 children in uh, in 13 different schools across the different states uh, of, of the country. So we followed the same thing. We send out the parents the details. And we said to the parents, for the children who are not going to have permission to join, they will simultaneously join those classes through Microsoft Teams synchronously at the same time from home. Uh, so uh, currently, that's how education is being uh, imparted. I can tell you roughly, if you have a class of 15 to 16, we are seeing at the same time roughly 99% of the kids are in school. But there may be one or two kids who are missing out. But they are not missing out on the class because they are connected with the, uh, with the teacher's laptop. And they are connected on Teams because all our classrooms have moved digitally on Microsoft Teams and Office 365. So all the collaboration happens through there. And, and therefore, the children who are unable to come to school, they can just join the call at that point of time. The children who are in the class, they are getting the live teaching. But through the teacher's laptop, they can connect. Uh, as that's getting screencasted onto the school, uh, onto the multimedia uh, thing in the classroom. So therefore, we can uh, we can just see that how they can interact. So I was I, I've been all around and looking at the interaction and how uh, children are interacting. The ones who are sitting at home with the ones who are sitting in the classroom, uh, and even having you know through the breakout rooms participating in various activities. So interesting, no problems. I think the challenge is to ensure that they're all connected. So as long as they have a good connectivity and we upgraded our school's uh, uh, bandwidth to 1 Gbps. So to ensure that even if there were 1,500 people who were on their laptop streaming, they didn't have a network uh, connectivity issue. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing um, those insights and obviously leveraging the technology tools to really keep students connected, regardless of whether they're in classroom or out. Um, we will come back to you. I think there's a few questions coming through the chat. So thank you for that initial oversight. Robin, I'd probably like to um, ask you this, the same question. Um, obviously, uh, with your role, how are you how are you sort of making those hybrid learning experiences really seamless for both students and teachers? Right. Thanks. Thanks, Delvin. Uh, what we did here was not just one model which we employed. Uh, there were different strategies which were used because the let me give you the uh, perspective around what what exactly this complex system of Delhi government is like. There are more than thousand schools here. They are close to 1.8 million students. They are close to 60,000 teachers. So here we are talking about a scale of a very unprecedented level. What we did was to do a very fragmented strategy for different class group. Uh, for the higher grades where we saw that device penetration was quite high and access to devices, some of the students had their own devices through which they can they could access uh, the content. So there we ran uh, centralized online classes so that they can get uh, a full sense of the curriculum. And the teachers at, uh, at their classroom or school level would engage with the students through Google Meet, through Zoom, or through WhatsApp groups also. Uh, for the middle grades, uh, what we did was to uh, create a series of worksheets which were disseminated centrally through different WhatsApp groups. However, we also were cognizant of the fact that uh, the kind of socioeconomic strata the students are coming from, not everyone would have access to devices. So what we did was to keep a printed copy of the, those worksheets inside the school so that the parents and the students can come in there, take out their weekly quota of the worksheets, come back again next Monday, submit those and pick up the lot for the next uh, for the coming incoming week. For the primary grade students, we had a very different and interesting strategy. What we also realized is that for it's in, important to keep those students engaged rather than teaching them math, science, English, etc. So there again, uh, we relied heavily on the worksheets. Uh, but what teachers were also able to do is to send audio notes send uh, their own videos through which the students were able were able to engage in different kind of activities at their home itself. Now, uh, the situation in Delhi is, is a bit different from, from the entire country. Uh, we opened after almost close to 1.67 years. However, due to the rise in pollution, the schools were closed again. 
so okay, the kind of reality which hit us is that schools are going to be closed on and off and this is what we have to deal with but what has happened in this entire process is that teachers have kind of become very uh, tuned to using devices using online mediums we did partner with google also got more than 40000 teachers trained on using different google uh, different uh, google tools etc so now we are in a place that we are almost ready uh, you know this large system is almost ready to uh, kind of take on to this uncertainty as the pandemic brings us one and if if i could just um ask one i guess further question on that robin before we start really looking at some of the the questions in the chat what do you think have you got an example of one of the largest success stories um of the technology that you've used to really enhance that you know hybrid or blended model can you give us an example of what one of those success stories is yes so it's it's very interesting delvin you know when we when we started in the beginning what we relied on was uh, a lot of third party uh, videos and animations uh, as a learning content which can be disseminated to the students but what we also realized is that uh, the students and it's very behavioral they are habituated of seeing their own teachers uh, uh, who who can uh, and they are able to connect with them much better uh, the kind of language the teachers use the kind of context which the teachers are able to do so what we did was government went ahead and created its own studio where the teachers could come in and record their uh, you know uh, videos on different topics so what we did was to create a entire team of star teachers so uh, uh, to just give you the context around it say for there is a topic in math which a particular teacher x is able to teach well while there is another topic which a teacher y is able to do well so through this studio model what we were able to do is to that all these star teachers were able to record their content in a very very high quality manner which can then be disseminated across the school system so really building that wider community of expertise um and then getting the benefit in the hands of learners sounds sounds fantastic thank you so much robin for sharing mark i might take the opportunity to come back there's a question specifically for you in the chat you talked obviously about really leveraging um i guess parents as part of the process um in you know in our environment here in new south wales um the question is what are the challenges faced during parent webinars can you give us a little bit of insight around um on that topic great question and and, and insightful too um yeah look the, the the main concern was that parents were just stressed that they were doing they weren't doing enough for their child um they they weren't sure whether or not they were, were working long enough whether there was enough content to keep the child engaged or whether there was too much content and the child was um being overwhelmed with too much cognitive load so um i guess talking through I, i'm a parent myself uh, i have three boys um one graduated high school last year one's going to be graduating high school next year and and my youngest is in in primary school and they're all in the public system that i work for so um i was able to at least speak on experience as well um with regards to the fact that you're really just trying to um i guess enable and keep the children engaged in the work that's there uh and anything that's not um certain that parents because i know when i went to school it was a lot different to even when i went to to teacher training and when i was teaching myself it's a lot different to how you learn things these days uh and trying to explain to parents that look just because it's different to the way you learned it doesn't mean it's wrong the reason why we teach it is we have a little bit more understanding about how brains work and how people learn so just trying to allay some of those fears give some very basic general understanding to parents how we teach general mathematic concepts and and some of the english concepts as well because we really focus heavily on literacy and numeracy um and that tended to to sort of like i guess lift the load of parents um uh, particularly from that welfare concern i think so they were highly successful and and very well attended live sessions we ran with the parents Fantastic. Um hopefully that answers really seamlessly the question that came through from um our community which is great. There is another question I might stick with it at the moment. It's related again to parents. Um I'll like open it up to all three of you actually to answer um and give your perspectives. The questions around is hybrid learning and education going to become costly for parents to afford? Um is is someone able to kind of give their insights and expertise? Delvin I'll, I'll jump in on that one just quickly because I I think Abumanyu and and Robin both highlighted some very similar things to what's happening in New South Wales as well in 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 the fact that there is a level of um if if our students can't provide the devices themselves the the state tries to provide the devices too for the school and the school then has a stock of devices that it was able to loan out 
um, for the students. So, and our targeted approach was focusing on stage six, which is our top end of schools, plus our low socioeconomic, plus also our rural and remote. So the students that were most likely to have a problem with engaging with hybrid learning. And as a result, we were also able to flick through very much as Abomaniu had said, um, between paper-based sometimes and technology, because sometimes technology isn't going to be the thing that's going to get you across the line. You do need to have option B. But I, I certainly was um, heartened to hear the fact that very similar, even though so far away, we were offering the same types of options there for our students. Abomaniu or Robin, would you like to sort of add in some of your um, insights around sort of that costly approach for parents so, anything else to add so honestly speaking uh Delphine, I, I don't i don't see any increase of cost from the parents point of view because it it's rather from the infrastructure which is required from the school so if the children who are coming at school because you see becoming online uh children at home if they're of that strata where you have access to device and data at home they already have that infrastructure in place and i think most of the schools also have that in place now it's the question of if you cannot come to school can you access school uh so there so you know there is a uh, there is a um silver lining here that i do not see going forward like you know i understand the issue in delhi where you have this you know issues of pollution days and you cannot call the children into school but children are not going to be missing school anymore because they have that ability to connect. And, and so the straight answer is I do not see any increase in costs. Uh, but obviously, if you have children from that straight of the society who do not have access to data or connectivity, I think that's where the issue is. Absolutely. And, and most governments are coming out with solutions to actually support those children. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, my next question that's come through the, the channel, Robin, I'd really love for you initially um, to perhaps give some of your insights and expertise. The questions come around how are we sort of how are schools addressing the potential that students in class um, are perhaps at a different stage um, of performance as those that are not in the class or vice versa? Can you can you give some insights about how schools are addressing that or how you are through your lens? Yeah, uh, thanks, Dilwin. Uh, I think th we are at a very interesting, uh, you know, juncture in the history of education. I would say, uh, you know, the kind of syllabus, the kind of curriculum which was thrown to those students. Now is the time to actually question that tyranny of syllabus. You know, uh, students have missed uh, the schools for close to two years now, and whatever we have been teaching for uh, so many years, uh, now we are questioning that how much of that needs to be taught. Are, are we going to focus purely on the syllabus? Are we going to focus? more on the skills and the attitude and the foundational learning. So uh, what, what we at Delhi government have done is to, is, is, is to you know, take it back to the school community, um, have made them ponder over this question. And what came out of it was really, really beautiful. What was decided out, out of that collective exercise was the fact that for the next coming few months, if not years, we are going to focus only on bridging that academic learning loss which has happened, rather than focusing on what is uh, centrally prescribed syllabus and each school is free to kind of you know design its own system around how how can it cater to bridge that particular gap so uh, in india what we have seen and specifically in uh, delhi also despite uh, very concent con concentrated efforts children are not at their grade le levels so now is the time when there is an enough acceptance from the school community from the parents also that we can teach the children at where they are at versus teaching them what grade levels uh, they need to be at. So that, that's what uh, we at the Lego government are planning to do. Fantastic. Mark, I wondered if you perhaps, given um, obviously we're in a different scenario here where the majority of our students are back in school, um, let's hope that lasts. Can you perhaps talk to that point of that bridging of the gap and the variations between those students at home versus those students in the classroom? Yeah, great question. Um, so we, we've implemented um, for, for all schools uh, a thing we term as the check-in assessments. So um, when students were returning back to school, the focus was on giving a baseline or benchmarked assessment on their literacy and numeracy um, scores and levels to try and see what that was like out across the state. We then implemented a program last year and it's been extended into this year. It's a $300 million investment 
called intensive learning support. And essentially what it enabled us to do is to provide every school uh, based on their check-in assessment results for their students uh, with funding to engage with tutors that will work on a one-to-one -one with students to try and bump up their basic literacy and numeracy and try and, I guess, pick up or close that gap that may have been a that may have been caused by, for whatever reason, um, disengagement with teaching and learning. Because um, to be honest, I find it hard to engage with my work working remotely anyway. So I can imagine how kids are. Um, but also to try and just give them that extra push to try and um, circumvent whatever issues or damages may have been caused by that break. And that's been extended then into 2021 and 22. Uh, so we'll see that continue next year to try and push that ongoing improvement and, and try and flip around, um, I guess, what has happened. And we offer that both face-to-face -face and for our schools that are remote, we can do that remotely online through video conferencing technology. Wonderful. Um, I guess, Abhiman, you through your lens of having a very large school um, and obviously really dealing with um, you know, this challenge, what, what are your thoughts on, I guess people call it the digital divide? Um, can, you, can you talk a little bit more about how your school is perhaps overcoming those gaps and that digital divide as well? So, um, you know, before we went embarked on this journey of uh, digital education, we ensured that all the children had devices, all the children had connectivity. And I must tell you that, you know, if I go back like, almost 19 months when the lockdown started. It was the March of 2020. Um, the first challenge was to ensure that everybody had a device and everybody had a uh, connectivity. Uh, so we are part of a large uh, industry, Reliance Industries, and you know we have a big digital company called Geo, which actually helped us to connect uh, all those people who didn't have broadband connectivity in their houses and uh, it is something that we extended to uh, all the schools that we have in the network, which is, as I said, about 15,000 children across uh, 13 different schools in different states. And uh, so that is the first thing to ensure that there was no digital divide. But when you talk in the terms of what you're talking about, New South Wales government or Delhi government, it's a different ballgame. You're talking about, uh, you know, probably 200,000, 500,000 children. And you have a digital divide because children come from across the strata of the society and not everybody has got connectivity. And therefore, you need to innovate and find out how you can use different methods like they were talking about, you know, calling the kids to school, or reaching stuff at home or doing things on WhatsApp, which is low data uh, usage and stuff like that. I don't think that's what our situation is uh, as, as an institution. I mean, touch would be, you know, all the kids who, who come to school, we have ensured that everybody had to. But yes, initially when we started, that was the situation and we quickly sort of turned that around. I must also say that one way that institutions can move along, even I think government institutions can move along, if they can form a large professional learning community. Because when you are going in this divide, so initially went from offline to online, then we are going from online to hybrid. And I think most of the places are coming back from hybrid to this thing. You will have teachers who are going to be leading the technology integration. If we can get a sort of community growing around them where they share best practices, they talk about things which are successful in the classes. So we have we started this something called Tech Tuesdays in our school uh, since March 2020. And everyone shares one good idea in five minutes so every week with 30 minutes you have six good ideas which are coming along and and what has happened initially it was only the tech leaders but today even the ones who were in the middle of the crowd and in the in the end of the crowd they are also being encouraged you see when you're in good company when you see good practices shared along you get inspired to share whatever little or small that you can do and that culture will ensure that we as institutions and teachers will be able to maneuver between offline, hybrid, online, because this is not going away anywhere. You know, I don't think going back to school for five days a week and, you know, doing extracurricular activities, it's still time to come. So we need to sort of move around these things and we need to figure out how we can inspire each other with, with good practices so that this can continue. 
Yeah, absolutely agree. And as a parent um, and an ex-teacher, I couldn't agree more with that professional learning community that you are talking about. And I know, Robin, you talked a lot um, through your lens about how you're trying to build that community um, of professional learning and sharing expertise. Um, sounds really, really exciting. I guess leveraging that now, um, Robin, I might ask you first, um, what are you most optimistic about coming into 2022? Children coming back to school. <laughs> Of course. <laughs> but also the fact that uh, we are at a stage where uh, there is enough technology penetration uh, when we talk about large scale public education system that that adaptability uh, kind of takes its own sweet time. But the pandemic has shown us that now is the time to actually immerse oneself into it. And uh, I feel we as a, a, a large scale system are ready to embrace technology in whatever way, ensuring that there is no further digital divide because of that. And, and I guess um, with that optimism of, of students returning to school, what considerations are you giving to, I guess, the, the health and well-being and that social, emotional well-being of students as well? Can you talk a little bit about that? Thank you so much for asking that. I mean, in fact, uh, this is uh, this this again came from the school community itself that in the initial couple of months, we are not going to focus anything on the syllabus and the way the school hours are divided would be proportionately divided among social, emotional well-being and the foundational learning. Uh, Delhi government has experimented a very new kind of curriculum called happiness curriculum, which focuses on the social well-being of the student. So happiness classes, which run uh, 40 minutes every single day, are now going to run for more than uh, close to two hours every day uh, when the students come back to the school. Wow, fantastic. Um, thank you for sharing. Mark, I guess over to you. What, what are you most optimistic about moving into 2022 and what learnings should we all be taking forward? Well, fingers crossed, everything keeps going down the healthy path. Um, I'm looking forward to the technology being used for more than just a survival, but a thrive type of opportunity where um, now that schools are starting to embrace technology from it, their, their, their forced experience, that we start to look at the creative ways in which we can really leverage and harness it. So looking at, at getting expertise right across the state and the world coming into our classrooms to make that online learning and for learners anywhere, anytime to occur and make that a reality. And, and I think that's exciting. I've got a team of people ready to go to support schools that want to look at more innovative ways on how to, to use and leverage the technology for improving student outcomes. And can you give us a, a sneak peek quickly, Mark, on maybe one of those strategies of how to really leverage that teacher capability? Because I'm sure they're feeling very overwhelmed at this time of the year. We have a, a program we're currently rolling out called the Rural Access Gap, which is addressing that. We have quite a significant teacher shortage in New South Wales that's only going to grow over time, uh, particularly in our country areas. So um, leveraging uh, science and mathematics teachers, uh, which are the hardest to find in some areas um, via video conference so that we can actually deliver full content to our students. We've also been leveraging um, industry experts as well to run um, uh, different lessons for engagement with students via our VC platform. So these are the types of things that we're engaging with and really reaching out to some of our remote Aboriginal communities um, where we have a significant gap in student learning, where we can really draw down because the technology the robots and the things that we put out through our STEM kits are highly engaging for students and really connecting them to their education. So these are the sorts of things I think we need to leverage more uh, as 2022 rolls in. Very exciting. I have a son that'd be very excited at the thought of that. Um, I guess, Abhimanyu, I'm going to ask you the same question. What are you, what, what are you optimistic about for 2022? I think the movement uh, between, between hybrid to back in school and seeing the children not only doing their uh, classes in school, but also the extracurricular activity, sports, what has been missed out, the co-curriculars, mm -hmm. you know, those are things, the interactions, the exchanges, mm -hmm. uh, you know, things which happened outside the classroom. Uh, we were, I think all schools were on a survival mode initially. So when we went online, we, we tried doing some of these exchanges. So uh, I think over the last two years or uh, 18, 19 months, we have done three online exchange programs with the seven partner schools that we have got. But I think uh, as things open up, probably we can see those things happening in person. Uh, you know, the co-curricular activities and experiential learning, which is not happening inside the classroom, the hands-on stuff, which has not happened. And uh, just looking into data over the last three or four months, uh, 
it's very clear that there is a learning loss. And therefore, there has to be a focus on covering that learning loss to ensure uh, first figure out where the children are and then gradually take on. But I, I agree with, uh, you know, the whole approach of first settle the kids into school. So slow and steady, settle them back into school. And my reading of how things works, it, it takes about three to four weeks for the kids to actually get accustomed to getting back into school with masks and testing and everything else which is happening. Um, and I think once that happens, gradually it can happen. So I can tell you now we are having sports activities, but within the bubbles that we have established for these classes. So if there's a year 12 class who is there, they can play within year 12. They're not mixing with the 11s or they're not mixing with the 8s. But at least, and we have ensured that at least there is a 45 minutes of sports activity which is given to them, whether that is something that the kids have missed maximum across the thing. So uh, my looking forward will be smiles on the face of the children back to school and uh, getting into sort of that normalcy. But I don't think we will achieve full normalcy in 2022. But it's that progress forward and trying to get them experiential outside of the classroom, lab activities that they have missed, uh, you know, hands-on stuff. The reading, uh, you know, has, has, has quietly hit. And obviously, literacy numeracy, I think those will be the focuses going forward. Wonderful. I, I mean, we could go on for the next half an hour or an hour with some of the questions coming through and the interesting perspectives that you're all giving. Um, I am really excited for what we can take forward into 2022. We have learned a lot in the last couple of years on how to leverage technology. And I really, really appreciate all of your um, expertise and insights in today's discussion on the frameworks and the models and the success stories that you have been finding within your schools, your um, countries. And I really appreciate and thank you for all of your time. We didn't get through, apologies to the um, the group, we didn't get through all of the amazing questions that were coming through that chat. Um, we ran out of time, but thank you again, Abhimanyu, Robin, Mark. It's been an absolute pleasure having a discussion with you, albeit too short. Yeah. Thank I you, would, uh, I'd like to, uh, to echo Delvine's sentiments there and also pass on my thanks to, uh, to you, Delvine, and, uh, and Mr. Robin Kishore and uh, Abhimanyu Bazu and uh, Mark Greentree for all of your fantastic insights and appreciate your optimism for, uh, for 2022. So, uh, so fingers crossed for next year. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Sarah. Fantastic. And uh, with that, we're going to head into uh, the second block of our showcase uh, presentations. And we're going to start with uh, Wendy Haig from, um, from Stronger Brains. Now, I believe, Wendy, we've got you here. Perfect. I can see you on screen, Wendy. You look great. Um, and we've got your presentation visible as well to everyone. So uh, what I might do, Wendy, is give you, uh, I'll hand over to you for at the three or four minutes. Thanks, Sarah. Welcome, everyone. Um, as Sarah said, my name is Wendy Haig. I'm the co-founder of Stronger Brains, along with Dr. Michael Merzenich, who's one of the world's leading brain scientists. We're offering a brain-based approach to improving student outcomes. We now know that the brain is plastic and it can be strengthened or weakened by life experiences. But when the core functions of the brain develop well, the brain can easily build the skills required for learning and social and emotional health. However, we've learned that childhood adversity, such as living in poverty, um, abuse, neglect, living with domestic violence, can weaken the brain's foundations for learning, and students impacted by adversity generally don't get the help they need. Cases or adverse childhood experiences are very common. One in five people in Australia have an ACE score above three, but in India, this is probably much higher. And with four or more ACEs, we know that school behavior problems are three times more likely, poor attendance is five times more likely, and mental health problems are six times more likely. And we can actually see now and measure the difference between a healthy brain and an unhealthy brain. And we know that without proper intervention, the brain will never develop with full function. So what we offer at Stronger Brains is a solution that enhances the core neurological abilities, fundamentally improving learning and social and emotional health. 
We're currently working with 10 to 25 year olds in primary and secondary schools in Australia, the UK and the USA. Um, we're also working with vocational and technical further education colleges, tertiary sector, employment services, disability services, and even with young people not in education, employment or training. And what we offer is a quick and easy online brain health assessment. Um, we offer a brain health curriculum to teach students about their amazing brains, including online resources and videos for students, staff and parents. Uh, we offer professional development workshops and online resources for staff. Um, we offer personalized brain training and social and emotional learning plans optimized for each student based on their brain assessment. And we offer a collaborative affordable approach combining the best of both online and human elements of education through our train the trainer model. And it looks something like this. We'll provide the digital in in intervention and we'll partner with um, frontline staff on the ground for the human intervention. We've got the evidence that it works. We've seen amazing transformations in children and young people across the world. We also see measurable improvements in um, school completion rates, relationships, staff stress levels, bullying, mental health, uh, physical health, job confidence, job readiness, job motivation, job success. So we're about transforming or changing the life trajectories of young people in India for the better. And if you'd like to partner with us, please get in touch at strongerbrains.org or you can email me at wendy at strongerbrains.org. Thank, Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Wendy. And what we'll do now is move um, on to our second uh, showcase presenter for this block, which is Elaine Starkey, the CEO at Global Study Partners. Welcome, Elaine. Thank you, Sarah. Delighted to be here with you today. And hi to everyone in India participating. I'll just share my screen here with you. Fantastic. I'll let you know once it's visible. Perfect. And we're good to go. I'll hand over to you. Fantastic, Sarah. So uh, Global Study Partners is a two-sided marketplace for international student recruitment. I'm the CEO and founder, and I'm thrilled to be here today. And um, look, we, I'm, I'm a teacher by background, and we're all very passionate here. I think we all share that passion for education. So it's lovely to be in, in an audience that has the same passion and drive. Um, we believe that education is transformational and it changes lives. But very often students are denied access to the right choices when they decide to go overseas to study. And that's where GSP is a solution. It's a two-sided marketplace for international student recruitment. Um, and look, we have fantastic news to share because I was in India only three weeks ago, actually. I think I was on one of the first flights out of the country. Um, and we have signed an exclusive um, purchasing agreement with Upgrad, who is uh, one of the largest ed tech leaders in India. And their founder, Ronnie Skruvala, Skruvala, is really excited about this partnership because we can now offer not only study, study overseas options, but also online and blended learning options as well. So um, that's great news to share with you. We also are the winner of the New South Wales Exports Awards um, this year. So we were thrilled to actually win that award in the education and training section. Um, so really, look what we do, it's a one-stop shop for international uh, student recruitment. And it's a bit like, to make it simple, it's a bit like an Expedia for international student bookings. If a student wants to go overseas to study, they can search, compare and shortlist and apply to thousands and thousands of courses in multiple study destinations. Um, today, we have over 1,500 recruitment partners. We say recruitment partners because it's a B, very much a B2B channel. Um, we work with school counsellors. So if your school wants to offer really choice, good courses, choice, and enable students to travel overseas and use our platform to access this choice, they can sign up as a, student, as a school counsellor in the platform. It's also available to education agents, to um, test prep centres, and really any quality provider 
provider that has access to international students that want choice. Um, we're founded here in Sydney, Australia, and this is our head office, but we operate throughout India, Bangladesh, Vietnam, Philippines, Pakistan, Brazil, Ireland, and Nepal. And we offer multiple destination markets, although we're strongest in Australia, being Australian based, of course, and 70% of our student flow comes into Australia. We're actually building out the other markets in parallel, and we've had um, quite a lot of uptake for UK, Ireland, US and Canada also in the last six months. Um, we have over 45,000 courses available on our course finder and we're contracted with some of the best universities in the world. We have actually contracts with over 675 institution partners globally. So what problem are we addressing in the market really? Um, I think our Indian audience particularly will relate to this. If a student wants to go overseas to study, they generally go to their local education agent. The education agents, um, it, it's a really important service. They offer it to speak to a student and counsel them one-on-one, -on -one, but they're lacking transparency, connectivity, choice, and really access. And many education agents, migration agents, or may only have access to two or three universities. And some Sometimes they are driven by commission. So rather than compete with this very important channel, we set on a mission to empower the channel and give them unparalleled access to core stock to um, enable them to choose um, multiple study destinations for their students through a unique and scalable platform. How it works, it's very simple. They can search, compare, shortlist and apply and then integrate student services like um, jobs, like internships, like insurances and any services that are valuable to the student because at the end of the day it's the outcome of the student is really what our business vision is all about and what our model is all about. Um, we see huge opportunity in India and I'm excited to be speaking with you today. There's 770,000 um, students from India studying overseas at the moment but this is forecast to grow to 1.8 million by 2024-25. And really students are driven by really good educational systems, higher standards of living, higher incomes, careers and access to Fantastic. Thank you so much, Elaine. I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but um, but that does bring us to time. Um, so what I'll now do is ask uh, is ask IFM um, to join from Illuminate eLearning. Fantastic. And uh and for anyone that wants to connect more with Elaine um, or Wendy, you can visit the uh, expo booths. All right, fantastic, Ifam. Have we got your screen share ready? Yep. Can you see my screen? So we can, and that is ready to go. Hello and good day to everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present in this prestigious event. Uh, so my name is Ifam Hassan. I'm the CEO and founder of Illumina eLearning. Uh, Illumina eLearning is a, a tech company specializing in digital assessments, delivering proctored and not proctored exams to over 1 million uh, students across uh, various global regions. And we are seeing many more institutions coming on board in 2021. So we currently work with uh, We currently work with broad range of uh, customers from universities, medical colleges, uh, government organizations, schools, and global corporations for delivering their online proctor and non-proctor exams and continuous assessments. So today, the education sector has gone through a deep structural changes since 2020. So this is not just running the online classes, but also there are wide ranging impacts has been on the assessments and examinations. For example, in India, the CBC board had have had to cancel their exams a few times. Therefore, the way the exam is conducted today in a traditional fashion is no longer valid and it's no longer an option. This mandates a digital intervention where you can run your exams online um, in your campus or you can ask your students to sit exams uh, remotely from home, still keeping it fair and equitable. So we are currently helping the education institutions using um, uh, conduct the exams online using our platform called SSAP. It is a proven digital assessments and proctoring platform. Using these platforms, you are able to deliver both venue-based and remote high-tech exams and practical assessments. The way it works is you are able to conduct your online exams in exam center and campuses by simply uploading your questions and exams into our platform. This distributes your exam papers 
to the uh, right students at the right time at the right exam and then the students can sit the exams and the invigilators can um, mark the exams online the results can be published online as well when it comes to conducting the exams uh, uh, remotely uh, so you are able to basically uh, have your candidates sitting the exams uh, from their pcs at home and then the candidates can be verified the id can, can be verified using artificial intelligence and the candidates can begin exams and they can complete the exams and the proctoring session ends so while the candidates are doing the exams the remote invigilators can log in and start exams for candidates and wait for any alerts and initiate chat with candidates also control the exams using start pause lock resume and terminate exams so just to give a wrap up uh, so we are a team with 60 plus years of experience delivering online assessments and learning so we have proven experience in delivering large scale assessments to over 1 million assessments every year or to across 500,000 learners so we are able to provide you with a flexible and scalable assessments and learning solutions catered to countrywide or statewide implementations, still keeping any individual school requirements. So we are committed to quality and service. We will collaborate with our clients to meet their visions and goals. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Fam. Um, we are having a, a minor technical issue. I think what we're going to do is jump straight into our uh, next thought leadership conversation. So. It is my, uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, to you Kevin Morgan, who will be facilitating this discussion. Um, yeah, to introduce you to Kevin, uh, Kevin is, a chief, is the Chief Operating Officer and Executive Director of Global Study Partners, an Australian developed global platform that helps students anywhere in the world to search, find, compare and apply for higher education courses across the globe. Recently acquired by Upgrad, India's largest provider of online and digital learning services, uh, GSP is poised to play a growing role in the discovery of and access to the full range of education options for domestic and international students. So welcome, Kevin. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Great. And, uh, and it's great to be here. You've gone. So um, look, today we're going to be, I think, exploring a really interesting topic, uh, one that has been uh, quite top of mind for a lot of people as the impact of COVID has accelerated uh, the digital transformation in the way that institutions globally need to engage with their students. Um, and we're going to be having a conversation today with Dr. Raj Singh, who's the Vice Chancellor of, of Jain in, um, in Bangalore. Dr. Singh has got over 40 years of experience, including 27 years in education and has been the, the Vice Chancellor of several prestigious um, universities. Joining us also is Professor Merlin Crosley, who is the DVC, the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academic and Student Life at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. Uh, gentlemen, um, welcome and thank you for joining us. I think the thank central you. theme we're going to be exploring in our conversation today is your experiences that you can share with our audience of how institutions are capitalising on online learning while preserving the student expectations of the campus life um, and what the, the pivoting that has been imposed to a certain extent on institutions over the last 12 to 24 months um, is playing itself out in your experience. I think to kick off, the question that, um, that jumped up at all of us when, when considering this is, uh, is in fact um, the traditional uh, on-campus live lecture dead? Um, did it die years ago and we just didn't notice? Uh, what's the, what, what, what are your experiences in terms of, of, of delivering and the expectation of your new and continuing students um, around um, the, the growth of the digital platform uh, and some of the, the imposts that have been um, delivered on us through, through COVID? Um, Merlin, I'd love to get some of your initial thoughts. So, Kevin, some of the lectures are dead. Uh, the 8 a.m. early morning uh, maths lecture is struggling. But there are some lecturers who are wonderful performers and they enjoy their own performance. They're absolutely keen to keep going and they are attracting an audience. So I think what we'll see is some high-quality, possibly interactive performance, narrative-based lectures continuing to draw a crowd, the occasions to synchronise people's learning and get young people together. 
but they'll also be recorded. There'll be a digital backup. And I think it's going to be increasingly hard to get people into the lecture rooms and cram them in at 8 a.m. in the morning. So I don't think the lecture is dead, but I think only the high quality lecture will work and students will vote with their feet. Thank you. That makes sense. And Dr. Singh, your experience um, in, in, in a slightly different market and, and a different environment, are you seeing the same things or are you seeing different behaviours and different uh, paces and natures of embracing what is looking like a new normal? Uh, thank you, Kevin, uh, for having me here. Uh, good afternoon uh, to the audience. Uh, well, uh, uh, lectures are not dead at all, but yes, uh, the proportion of lectures, visual activities will uh, certainly change. On one hand, uh, online mode of uh, lecturing has provided uh, tremendous flexibility and uh, a fertile ground for innovations. It also made us realize that uh, we need to find a new normal uh, post-COVID because uh, all normal, at least in India, has not really worked. Uh, for example, we have been uh, trying to find uh, solutions to many problems in education. Uh, may it be bringing in more interdisciplinarity, maybe uh, greater emphasis on research and uh, practice. Uh, also, the, the issue of employability in some of the universities and uh, the, the post-COVID scenario, which I believe uh, the new national education policy announced last year uh, was waiting for uh, to find an appropriate time. And I often say that NEP as well as uh, COVID connived with each other so that the acceptability to change is all time high in Indian higher education. And uh, uh, we uh, believe that the post-COVID scenario will be wherein uh, uh, the, the whole schedule of academic delivery will undergo a change. And to my mind, uh, what we have adopted and uh, many are adopting in India is that uh, only one third of the time uh, the campuses will be open and they will be utilized for uh, essentials like practical labs uh, in some disciplines and uh, group activities in other disciplines. The one third which will go on online in the blended mode uh, will basically cover theoretical lecture and it was pointed out by previous speaker, only high quality uh, lectures is what uh, uh, will work because they're available from anywhere across the world. It's not only that we have to uh, listen to our own professors. So this is a greater challenge uh, being posed. And the time we save through this online uh, uh, lecture of uh, theory contents uh, will be utilized for more uh, outside the campus activities, more field-based activity, uh, which I'll uh, deal with greater detail subsequently. But yes, uh, lectures will be there uh, in the change format. Excellent. Um, and as we see this this trend being driven, what what changes are we seeing happening um, in terms of the activity, the way that an institution organises itself and, and engages um, with its student population is um, the from from a technology and a reach and an engagement perspective. Um, I've, I've seen the terminology used in, in some of the reading and preparing for this, that part of the shift will be to a more student-centric and less teacher-centric model where the charismatic lecturer is the one who engages the group and, and makes things happen. And that, that in fact, um, group work and collaboration and, yeah. and broader content and the ability to bring um, different viewpoints and different students who aren't constrained by um, physical location to bear in, in, in that new methodology. How, how are you finding um, that as a proposition? Are you seeing that? You, do you see that as part of the way that the experience will change for both teachers and um, students? Martin, uh, Merlin, what do you think? So that's very interesting. I do think that the online student communities have a number of advantages. I think that it's possible to, uh, the barriers are lower for shy students. Uh, many shy students will engage in chat and forums in a way that they might not always engage within a large classroom. And I think that's good. I think also students who don't have English as a first language, it's sometimes easier to follow written words and also to look at recordings and go back. I think that is good. I think so. I think there are many good things about that. 
But I've also noticed during COVID that some of these online two-dimensional events, it's actually hard to keep track of timelines, developing relationships, and to see emotion and body language. So I think that um, one has to work really hard if one is looking for a fully online event. One has to work very hard to build those student communities, but it can be done. Well, that makes sense. Um, it's interesting. I've just seen a question pop up here. In terms of this new instruction model, um, one, one thinks of um, students and younger people as being the digital natives um, of our time. Is, is this a, a, an approach that is being demanded or driven by um, students? Um, or are we seeing uh, academic and better learning outcomes? Through these mechanisms is, is there a trade-off anywhere um are, are we being driven to a, a methodology by circumstance that we would rather not have or do we see that there's real benefits starting to or possibly able to accrue dr dr singh i don't know uh, I, I know you've done some interesting things around the project centric learning so maybe that's, that's oh yeah yeah that's right that's right part of, 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 so, of that um, yeah. That experience so, from the approach. See, um, uh, as, I, uh, as I said, the background um, uh, created by uh, the COVID as well as the new national education policy, the regulatory framework has also been changing in our country. And uh, the innovative tools and uh, methodology of teaching learning uh, will have two objectives. One, to replace uh, some of the lectures which will not be held uh, in synchronous mode, whether face-to-face -face or online. Um, uh, it will also be to address uh, the issues raised by uh, the new national education policy in India. And these issues vary from multidisciplinarity to higher order learning outcomes, as well as uh, laying more emphasis on entrepreneurship and uh, research kind of uh, activities to be undertaken uh, by the students. It was uh, in that background that uh, we at our university uh, started the concept of project-centric learning. And the interesting part is that it is not meant to be for a particular stream. Uh, it's meant for all the students across disciplines, all the 24, 25,000 students which we currently have. And they're essentially uh, group projects. Uh, to my mind, um, these project-centric learning activity uh, is slightly different from project-based learning because projects uh, in project-based learning essentially remain within the confines of uh, a particular course. Whereas uh, project-centric learning becomes the nucleus and all the courses being taught at a particular time uh, are connected with this, are supporting this. And uh, it's a group project, as I said, so it brings some kind of transdisciplinarity as well as, and all the group members come from different disciplines. Uh, if not disciplines, at least from different pathways within the same discipline. And it serves the uh, following purposes, apart from the fact that it leads to some kind of organic uh, development of business ideas. One, it helps us bring in multidisciplinarity, which is one of the emphasis areas. Second, it helps us achieve higher order learning outcomes. Third, uh, it increases the local appeal of the university because the focus is on solving uh, the problems of local industry and the community and the society, which has been one of the emphasis areas. And uh, uh, finally, it's in line with some of the national and global missions, including SDG4 of the United Nations. Uh, in India, we have uh, a self reliant India mission which does not mean that we should restrict ourselves from cut off from the rest of the world. Rather, uh, it increases more interaction uh, all over the world. But in a uh, pandemic kind of situation, uh, we should be more reliant, uh, as we have seen uh, through the experience of COVID. But if you look at purely academic outcomes of this activity, uh, one, it leads to development of uh, a patentable idea, the innovative idea. Second, some of these ideas will be commercialized and will lead to entrepreneurship, which is an emphasis area in the country as a whole because pandemic-like situation has put a greater demand on the innovation system of uh, the country and therefore of the university. And the least outcome will be a good quality papers uh, to be published by students as well as faculty or uh, jointly by them. And uh, the operations of this, that project-centric learning is supported by two activities. One is theory. And there's a course to be taught to all the students, giving them the basics of uh, uh, entrepreneurship, design thinking, innovation, business plan, financial uh, terminologies. And the second part is the lab for this, where each student will undertake an actual business throughout the program, mm -hmm. which uh, will uh, not only make them earn the fees they're paying to the university, 
but uh, possibly uh, will be able to uh, help the parents. Uh, we are trying, uh, and we have tested and we have uh, piloted this concept for last over one year. Uh, we want to move towards a zero cost education. I think uh, all this uh, goes to uh, the, the COVID situation because we're forced to innovate. Uh, you will agree with me uh, in COVID, uh, uh, the disposable income, the savings, the income people has really, really gone down. And the paying capacity has really been affected, particularly in the countryside. And on the other side, there's an emphasis on uh, more inclusive education, providing a higher reach. So I think these kind of concepts will really help us achieve those objectives. I think that's fascinating. The earn while you learn and make it a self-funding um, activity is, uh, I think, a great innovation, which is perhaps independent necessarily of, of where we've taken with COVID, but it's forced or, or created an environment for, for, for approaching the problem in, and, and the opportunities in, in, in different ways. Yes. Um, are we finding, as, as this happens, that our, our, our academics now and our lecturers need to refresh their teaching and learning capabilities, uh, either in terms of the tools that they need or, um, or, or, the, or the methodologies or, or the engagement approaches they take? What do you, what are you seeing, Melvin? Yes, so I think that's a vitally important point. When I started teaching, I had a piece of chalk and a blackboard, and I wasn't so excellent at, at drawing, but I, I soon got the hang of it. Nowadays, people have to learn the learning management system. They have to learn the right process for setting online exams, uh, which might be open book exams. They have to learn how to engage students and then going back to that learning management system, they probably have to learn a whole lot of new uh, technology, new programs and constant upgrades and options on the programs. Now, most of us will find our way through this instinctively and the most uh, widespread ones will be used most. But we're actually investing quite a lot in uh, helping our academics to learn. I think your question is very astute to ask this question. And I think the professional development of teachers, university teachers and all teachers will become increasingly important. So I think that's that's a terrific um, question. And then one of the other questions, if I may, Kevin, someone's yeah. asked, you know, is it is, is the online, do the students learn better? Do you know, during my experience, in my own learning and as a teacher, one of the difficult things about evaluating teaching methodologies is that everything works. With a COVID vaccine, some work, some don't. With a COVID medication, some work, most don't. But with a teaching method, the good students learn whether the teaching is good or not good. And so it's very hard to get scientific data. And I think we have to be careful about adopting methods without any scientific data but uh, we can also be confident that they will work because everything works with good students. So I think this is going to be over the next few years, there will be data, but at the moment, we're mostly feeling our way on the basis of instincts, which is fun, but uh, <laughs> it'll be interesting to see when data does finally come in on that question. No, I, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm thinking about one of the things that occurred to me as, as we you were talking about LMSs and different processes, uh, and this might not necessarily be um, in, in either your wheelhouse, but I'm sort of interested, particularly with the different environments, the, the, the geographies, which is for the idea of, of delivery versus design of course and course content um, in the context of um, uh, Dr. Singh and some of the things you mentioned or implied or inferred that there are big parts of India where perhaps access to high, high speed bandwidth and 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 the infrastructure to support um, content heavy delivery. How do, you, how do we start to sort of address the issue of we want stuff for our, for, for our students that is multimedia and, and multifaceted and engaging, but also has to be accessible and consumable? Is that presenting any issues in your experience? Uh, yes, uh, there have been issues uh, initially, uh, but uh, 
maybe the schools and the universities and colleges as well as the government has uh, taken initiatives in the last over one and a half years. And uh, we certainly have better connectivity and availability of um, electronic gadgets. Uh, but what we found out in the interim was that instead of synchronous, we perhaps lied more on asynchronous mode of teaching where uh, students could take these classes at their own convenience when they had better connectivity. Uh, for example, uh, uh, in certain campuses, uh, let's say uh, the students live in the hostel, there are some peak hours where connectivity will not be there. So students could use this flexibility and then uh, uh, do that. But over a period of time, as I said, the connectivity has definitely uh, uh, improved. Um, also, uh, in terms of uh, you know, a couple of issues, and there's one question I can see on the screen that the new instruction model uh, is what, what students were demanding, or uh, uh, we have seen academic uh, uh, learning outcomes to be achieved better than this. I would say both. Um, in the pre-COVID scenario, we have been facing challenges where students want to engage more in activities than uh, uh, theoretical lectures. And that is one of the problems I mentioned in the beginning that we were struggling to find solutions to this because uh, you'll agree with me in academia, uh, when we uh, upskill and reskill our teachers uh, more than the technicality, it is the mindset issue which we've been uh, facing. So while the training has uh, definitely been emphasized more, uh, but uh, I think if you engage students, some of those weaknesses are taken care of. And second, I said, uh, we, at educational institutions uh, had a huge demand from the uh, new scenario which is emerging. Regulatory changes have been made. For example, 40% online uh, contents have been permitted officially in regular degrees. So we needed to find certain ways and means of uh, engaging students without compromise on the attainment of learning outcomes, as I said. And uh, the second, uh, uh, I think, environmental uh, landscape which is taking place in our country is more emphasis on um, innovation and entrepreneurship. So this concept uh, basically marries uh, research and practice. We say uh, the punchline we have used for this is taking education to intersection of research and practice. I think these kind of tools in an institutionalized manner uh, help us achieve uh, those objectives. So again, coming to the examination, we use one innovation like uh, uh, Marlene was mentioning about body language and other things we have to have in the class. Uh, we were struggling to uh, assess students on certain uh, outcomes. Uh, so instead of um, asking them to write the answer or write and scan and send to us, we asked them to record a video of uh, five, six minutes and upload, uh, particularly in uh, communication-related classes. So it could uh, see the comprehensions, could see the uh, verbal skills, uh, and of course, the, the uh, technical skills in terms of answers. Uh, to my mind, uh, this has only provided a fertile ground for more and more innovations and we are really excited uh, in the post-COVID scenario when we find the new normal. No, I think um, I think it's an exciting space for for, for, for everyone involved in in education. Now, um, an interesting um, stat that I read again in preparation of this it was related to the to the US um, that roughly less than five percent of a institution's budget is spent on IT. Yet this is obviously um, a world we're entering where significant investment from institutions uh, and education and providers needs to be technology driven. How are you seeing um, the, the speed at which uh, institutions are adopting the technologies and what issues is that presenting both in terms of um, operationally inside um, uh, departments and in giving students a consistent experience uh, across either multiple institutions or multiple um, different streams of education. Is, is that an issue at all or are all platforms and delivery mechanisms created equally? You might, Merlin, you might have had some thoughts um, and some experience on that. So, so thank you, Kevin. I think this is one of the most challenging issues. So we have moved from being a, a bricks and mortar university and laboratory based at UNSW, University of New South Wales, Sydney, where we were over the last 10 years spending almost a million dollars, 300 million a year on campus infrastructure, equipment and buildings, capital works. Now we are increasingly dependent on IT infrastructure. 
but we find it much more difficult to identify the perfect building. We know if we need a new cancer institute or a new quantum computer institute or a new energy technology building, we find it much harder to know whether we should replace the learning management system. We're on Moodle at the moment. Uh, some of our staff absolutely love it. Other staff encourage us to move on to uh, different learning management systems. Every time we make a move, there's an enormous investment cost and everyone has to relearn how to do things. So we tend to be a little bit cautious. We try to upgrade our computer systems. We try to look for systems which will be stable, sustainable in the future, and that our graduates may even go on and use once they leave the institution. We're moving away from writing all our own systems because they won't necessarily use them. But on the other hand, we have academics who are inventing new gamification, uh, game-based education, new technologies with startup companies for educational resources. So we're trying to balance the rich, overwhelming choices with some stable foundations. I think it's very hard. Uh, we do it by consultation and we do it through our networks across Australia and the world to try to align with them. I see today, I've never used the Restream studio platform before. I've been mostly on Zoom and Teams, but actually the features are very similar and that's what I think will happen. It'll be like different types of phone. Every different type of electric phone, digital phone is different, but most of us intuitively use them because the systems are the same. And I think that's what will happen with um, online learning. Thank you. And with yourself or Dr. Singh, do you see any flow through in terms of challenge for students uh, in terms of being able to engage with, um, with the mechanism of delivering what sounds like some great programs and some great content? Uh, or or are, are we immersed and surrounded by exactly as you said, you know, th this idea that we kind of understand the interface and, and, and students will pretty quickly adapt to whatever mechanism um, we, we deliver that content and capability through. Uh, well, I'd say um, in India, uh, the slight difference because we are not the natives of uh, the, the technology age, but uh, uh, some of the students are. Mm -hmm. And I find they are much more at ease uh, uh, using the online platform. Uh, coming to your initial question, which um, I think was answered by uh, Lynn, was that, uh, yes, investments have been made, uh, not only in technology platforms and uh, increasing the bandwidth, but also, I think, uh, in training of the faculty members. For example, uh, uh, in uh, VR-based uh, technologies, uh, simulation-based technologies being used to engage students more and more, uh, uh, biggest challenge is of... Uh, uh, training our faculty members. And the second challenge which are facing, which also related to the student engagement is uh, uh, because uh, world over, and more so in India, initial uh, six to nine months, we quickly switched over to the uh, third party contents which are readily available. Because uh, I would say 90% uh, institutions were not prepared for this. Uh, very few institutions had been doing it, so they adapted very, very well. And for this, uh, you know, um, I may say something which uh, uh, may not be liked by the audience, uh, particularly the ad tech one. See, ad techs keeping away from the campus may not be able to help us much. And I'm making this statement after experience of dealing with them for almost a decade now. I think the time has come where uh, the ad techs have to be incubated on the campuses. Uh, there's a time for cohabiting of academic institutions and uh, ad techs to co-create curriculum and co-own. I think this journey uh, has to start to uh, really make students go through differentiated contents, quality contents, and perhaps uh, in a more uh, engaging manner. Uh, this is, according to me, uh, a major shift which will take place as it comes to working off institutions and ad techs together. No, makes sense. Well, gentlemen, I think we are just about reached the end. Um, I'm, I'm reminded of something I read recently that said the, the pace at which adoption and the race towards digitisation, particularly in the higher ed industry, 
um, has achieved in five months, which would in normal circumstances have taken five years. I think it's thrown up um, some really outstanding responses to a challenging time. I think I can see from what some of the things I've heard today that the future of a blended environment that allows a degree of interaction physically when they want it to be, but to bring together the assets of people and, and capabilities that are um, that are geographically very remote creates an opportunity, I think, for a much richer education experience as, um, as we start to mature with uh, the journey we've started. And certainly, I think I hear from guys like yourselves, um, the future is in good hands. So thank you very much for your time uh, and for your insights. And I hope the audience has uh, enjoyed that and got something out of it. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I'd also like to thank our speakers very much. Thank you, uh, Kevin Morgan, for facilitating today, Dr. Raj Singh and Merlin Crossley um, for lending your time and insights. It's been a pleasure. And uh, what we'll now do is head into the final uh, uh, showcase block of today's program. So I would like to invite to stage Desmond uh, Cohn, the Head of Partnerships from Sonorbus. Um, he be introducing the Sonorbus product to us. Hi, Desmond, how are you? Uh, just get your audio on, Desmond. Perfect. There all we good. Go. We're good. 2021, we're still figuring it out, but all good. It wouldn't be 2021 <laughs> if we weren't. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's great to be here, actually, to, to talk a little bit about Sonorbus. Um, for those of you who aren't very familiar with uh, Sonorbus, we're a software company that has designed a, a platform that allows Western companies or any institution outside of China to be able to build, measure, and optimize their digital presence for China without the need to physically be there. Now, we have a video um, that will just explain this a little bit in more detail, and I'll join in just at the end to, to clarify some points on that. So if you guys don't mind, we can, we can run the clip. With Sonorbus, you can create a professional and functional Chinese website and landing page, no coding required. Translate your copy as you go. Capture leads with our flexible form in a few clicks and connect them to your CRM or marketing automation tools. Preview your page on different devices, knowing that anything you build with Sonorbus is mobile responsive by default. And publishing just takes the click of a button. Once your website is live, our analytics dashboards give you the insights you need to outrank your competitors in the region. Sonorbus also allows you to manage your WeChat official account all from within the same easy to use platform. Write, edit and publish WeChat content in the intuitive post editor. Know who your followers are and segment them by demographics and engagement level for more meaningful interactions. Set up chatbots for seamless and immediate interactions with your followers. And stay on top of inquiries, even if you do not speak their language. Lastly, at Sonorbus, safeguarding your and your customers' data is our key priority. Our security framework keeps your business safe and makes it easy to be compliant with privacy laws across the globe. Want to learn more? Request a demo today to connect your organization with the world's largest online market. Great, so I hope that clarified a little bit about what we're talking about here. But why is that important? Um, so Sonorbus actually works with uh, hundreds of uh, higher education providers around the world because everyone's dealing with the same issue. If you're outside of China and you want to recruit Chinese students, you probably want a digital presence to be visible there. But unfortunately, nothing that's built outside of China is accessible or visible in there due to the Great Firewall. This presents a huge challenge to educators around the world who see China as an important market. And in the case of India, I mean, it's no different to the struggles of Australian universities in this regard. If anything, it's harder <laughs> due to the social media restrictions for certain Chinese apps in India. 
So um, I guess if an Indian institution wants to recruit students from China, the first issue is that nothing that they have is visible in China. And so through our software, any educator from anywhere in the world is able to build, measure and optimize their entire digital presence, which will help them build their brand and facilitate recruitment. So that's ultimately what our software is all about. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd encourage you all to, to reach out and uh, be happy to go into more information there and, and even show you guys a demo of the platform, and see how it works. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Desmond, for that. And uh, with that, we'll head on to our next uh, showcase presenter. I'd like to welcome Mohammed Hussain to stage. Hi. And to present StudyNet, I'll hand over to you now. I do believe we have a video to play, but uh, if you'd like to introduce yourself first and uh, let us know when you'd like it shown. Yes. Um, hi, uh, my name is Hussain. Uh, I'm founder and CEO of StudyNet. Um, we've been into the international student recruitment since 2008, and we've been experiencing that is a huge transformation is happening and lots of challenges throughout the process. Therefore, we create a platform to streamline the process of course search and selection along with the application process and acceptance in a single platform that will enable to for students, channel partners and institutions, everything in a single platform. So we are offering the solution through technology uh, to the world. So I'd like to uh, request you to play that video please. My story is no different than any other international students in Australia. I came at the age of 20 with $350 and a big dream. I faced a lot of challenges and difficulties as an international student. But I was fortunate enough to start my career in the education industry after seven months of my arrival in Australia. My name is Hussain. I am the founder and the CEO of StudyNet. StudyNet helps international students to study in Australia. When I was in my country, I saw many students cheated by fraud agencies. Their dreams were crushed into pieces. Due to that experience and my own, I decided to help other international students to give them a seamless journey. With that vision, in 2012, I opened this agency. With an idea of transforming our business processes through technology, we started building this system since 2013. However, it did not operate as we expected until 2015. Because I got involved in different types of businesses, and I failed four times miserably. Out of frustration in 2015, my wife and I enrolled in entrepreneurship development course at the entourage. It changed our life dramatically. We decided not to focus any other business but this business until we succeed. And then there was no looking back. Together with our dedicated team, we made StudyNet where it is now today. A young, vibrant, passionate, innovative and committed team who put the interest of international students first. Most importantly, we love what we do. StudyNet's EdTech platform streamlines the process of courses and selection along with the application acceptance process on a single platform for prospective international students, channel partners, and educational institutions. Therefore, we are on a mission of empowering lives around the world through education and with the purpose of making every step seamless for international students dreaming about studying in Australia. Therefore, I would like to welcome you on board to make international students' journey easier and worthwhile. Thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, you can vote. 
Fantastic. Thank you so much, Hussein. And and uh, and as mentioned, if you would like to go learn more about StudyNet, you can visit their booths in just a few moments. Um, first, I'd like to welcome to stage Chris Costandi from 60 Seconds. Hello, How are sir. you? Good, um, thanks, Sarah. That's good. And I, uh, I'll hand over to you and uh, go from there. Okay, I'll just share. Um, can you see, see my screen? Uh, we can't see your screen, unfortunately, at the moment. Maybe uh, see if you can you can get that up. Otherwise, we do have a video to show if you'd like that to be shown first. Yeah, that's okay. I can talk to uh, the few slides that I had and um, and then we'll go to the video. Thank you. All thank right, perfect. You. Look, first of all, thank you uh, to Sarah and thanks for Andrew Growth and uh, Investment New South Wales for hosting the event. Um, I'm Chris Costandi, uh, the COO of 60 Seconds, and I'm delighted to be able to present 60 Seconds to you all today. 60 seconds, what it is, it's a real-time communication skills platform used by students and educators to support the ongoing reinforcement and delivery of effective communication skills. Now, we work across multiple industries, including education, uh, to support organisations in helping them with customer engagement through the development and delivery of consistent, clear and compelling communication. Uh, in partnership with experienced consultants uh, and the technology, which is the 60 Seconds app itself, we help um, providers and, and, and organizations to challenge, to coach and drive measurable people improvement. And we've got engagements now in over 150 organizations, 500 teams and over 6,000 users globally. So what is 60 Seconds? Think about it as a remote mobile coaching app. And in this day and age, when a lot of us are working remotely, this is an opportunity for educators to be able to coach their students uh, remotely uh, beyond the, the classroom uh, in helping them deliver more impactful communication through regular practice and sharing. Now, the educator is able to support them through timely feedback on demand, if you like, uh, in helping build skills and confidence. And over time, we see those skills and confidence grow. And as, a, as, a, as, as um, an educator, there are, there are certainly um, some concrete and measurable outcomes that you can, uh, you can achieve as well. The whole platform is built on three pillars. The art of practicing to get better at how you communicate and how you deliver your message being able to be uh, provided with feedback and coaching on what you're doing and all of that being able to be measured um, uh, as well to see how you're progressing. Now, um, uh, Sarah, if you're there, if you could play the uh, video and we'll just hear a few words from our founder and CEO, Marcus West. big part that I found over my years of coaching around seeing people improve is around uh, an individual taking responsibility for their own improvement. I think a lot of the time people uh, realise that they can improve but then they don't go away and practice. And so the big part of 60 Seconds is that it creates an ecosystem for you to rehearse, for you to practice for you to receive feedback, for you to share, and all of that process around your engagement with it is measured. And so you can see, you know, I'm spending this much time, I'm getting this much better. And so it allows you to trace that process a bit like you would with a, with a personal trainer. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. So if anyone would like to learn more um, and uh, and actually see the uh, the platform, please join us in the uh, expo booth uh, right after this, um, this session here. Thank you very much, Sarah. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Chris, for that. And uh, um, again, echoing what Chris said, that uh, you are more than welcome to go and visit um, our showcase presenters from this last slot uh, in the expo booth hall. Um, and I believe we have uh, a short video to play from another participating company, uh, Health Starfed. Um, and you can go uh, learn more about Health Starfed in the expo booth as well. 
Health Staff Ed is a B2B company offering a white label solution that's flexible and modulated. We deliver lifelong learning solutions in an industry that demands continual learner engagement, monitoring, compliance and reporting. Numerous studies have identified post-registration continuing professional development, or CPD, as a nursing and health policy imperative for India. Approximately 5.76 million people make up the Indian healthcare workforce. Of those, 38% are nurses or midwives. That's 2.34 million people. Some estimates predict a 200% growth in the nursing workforce by 2030. And the World Health Organization estimates that an additional 4.3 million nurses are required in India by 2024 to meet international standards. Yet most have little to no access to CPD. With the estimate that health education has an approximate half-life of 2.5 years, CPD is a necessity for any program aimed at building a stronger and more resilient healthcare system. CPD fills knowledge gaps and improves technical competencies. It improves patient safety, quality of care, retention of staff and organisational commitment. Health Staff Ed wants to work with partners to fill the gap in India for nurses and the healthcare workforce more generally. We have a proven track record of delivering highly effective e-learning to targeted audiences, including the Aboriginal health workforce. For India, skills areas identified requiring urgent delivery of CPD include non-communicable diseases such as cardiovascular diseases, dementia, cancers, chronic respiratory diseases and diabetes, and maternal and child health. We have identified an Indian-based partner organisation who can facilitate the rapid tailoring of our CPD to meet the specific needs of Indian nurses. And we have hundreds of hours of CPD on all these topics. We also offer a full-service LMS, which is purpose-built for healthcare. It's agile, flexible and accessible 24-7. It's a solution for lifelong professional development an onboarding verification system, a live learning management system managing enrolment, assessment and certification, a learning planning and assignment program with built-in quiz creation and blends courses with live learning, e-learning, tasks and assessments. All these features mean that it's a one-stop portal for learning. It seamlessly integrates e-learning, live learning, assessment compliance monitoring, certificates and statements of completion. We have automated risk management systems and reporting that allow your administrators to get the information they need to act. You can add your own modules anytime and integrate with your current systems. It's audit ready 24-7, accessible on any device, scalable and secure, with ready access to support. Health Staff Ed works to ensure success for our clients every step of the way. Fantastic. Well, once again, for anyone who'd like to connect with Sonorbus, StudyNet, Health Staff Ed and 60 Seconds, please head to the expo booth in the trade hall for a product demonstration. Um, otherwise, it is now my pleasure to welcome the EduGrowth Managing Director, David Linky, to stage to facilitate the next discussion. Uh, David leads EduGrowth, bringing decades of experience in education, technology, software services, businesses from across Asia Pacific. For more than 15 years, David led the regional operations of a Google-invested global education technology vendor, and he brings a deep K-12 sector experience, um, and he's extended that knowledge into the higher education and school improvement domains uh, through partnership and collaboration from some of Asia Pacific's leading universities and NGOs. Here we go. Welcome, David. Thanks very much, Sarah. Really looking forward to um, this final session of today's New South Wales EdTech Dialogue. So we've got a great session ahead planned. And the concept we're going to try and address is online learning has established itself as an integral part of the modern education landscape, enabling education at scale. And we're going to sort of look at how the state of New South Wales here in Australia is innovating capability online and connecting that into India and vice versa. So we've got 
some amazing speakers. First up, we've got the CEO of T-Hub, MSR, joined T-Hub as Chief Executive Officer in October 2021, and he's an accomplished entrepreneur who's built and scaled businesses across geographies over his 33-plus year career in the IT sector. At T-Hub, MSR is committed to positioning the organisation to become a stronger innovation ecosystem enabler with high-quality outcomes. Welcome, MSR. Hi, MSR. How are you? Thank you. Uh, good, good, good morning. Oh, now I can hear you. Thank you very much. Um, MSR, allow me to welcome our other speaker that we've got with us, which is Malini, Malini um, Dutt, He's the, who is the Director of Trade and Investment India for Investment New South Wales. Malini Dutt is the Director of Trade Investment. Um, she is, sits on a number of steering committees. She's got lots of experience in the space, knows Australia incredibly well and is now working with Investment New South Wales. Malini, welcome. Hi, David. Very excited Hi, to be here. Yeah, really. And uh, I note that we've got another speaker, but we're having some te technical difficulty with uh, Monica Kennedy from Austrade. As soon as we resolve that, Monica will join us as well. But this is a really exciting conversation today. We're going to start thinking about what are these big countries are we able to achieve together? And I, I might begin with you, MSR, if you don't mind. And maybe you can give us a little bit of a brief introduction to T-Hub and then we'll come back and think a little bit about your program. So just quickly introduce us to T-Hub so we know who, who T-Hub is. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, so T-Hub uh, is a government-supported initiative. Uh, it's a, uh, just a little bit of background. Telangana is the youngest state of the union. Uh, Telangana was formed in 2014 and T-Hub was formed in 2015. T-Hub is a public-private partnership with uh, four uh, four institutions coming together, the government of Telangana, the Indian School of Business, Triple IT, uh, and the National Law School coming together. And our focus is on building an ecosystem around entrepreneurship and innovation. So we work with startups across a range of sectors. Uh, we bring in corporates to support these startups through access to funding, through access to mentorship, uh, you know, sell to, sell through, etc. And of course, our primary focus is around, uh, you know, scaling these startups and focusing on innovation, right? So pleased to be here and uh, look forward to the discussion. Awesome. And Malini, I'll offer you the same thing. Can you give us a bit of an introduction to Investment New South Wales for our Indian uh, audience? Right. So Investment New South Wales is the state government of New South Wales, Australia's formal trade and investment promotion agency. But what we really do here is uh, help uh, con commercial acceleration of uh, engagements between India and uh, New South Wales, Australia. So we're really helping New South Wales innovative technology solutions, products, uh, and introducing it to the uh, Indian industry here. And the awesome. office exists in Mumbai to facilitate this. And I see, I have to ask you, for our Indian audience, you have a Vivid Sydney poster behind you. And now I know Vivid really well. So if you are in India and thinking about coming to visit Australia, you should go to Sydney during Vivid. You will have an amazing time. You can go and see all of the light displays. It goes for like a couple of weeks, right? Is that right? Absolutely. And thanks for that reminder, actually. I'll have a look at that poster. <laughs> <laughs> we, I, I won't ask you when it is, all right? We'll, we'll let the audience look that up for themselves. So MSR, we'll move into our thinking about innovation across India and starting to think about deeply about this. So I might ask you, MSR, to begin thinking about startups. And I know that when I'm, as a non-Indian, when I start thinking about the innovation sector in India, uh, India I naturally, and I think um, lots of other people in Australia do as well, naturally think about Bangalore, right? like it's a bit of a tech hub. So I'm really interested in, your view about what has led to one of such of the exciting startup hub that T-Hub is and some of the programs that you deliver. Sure. Thank you, David. Yeah, so I think, um, as I said, Telangana was the youngest state in the union. And I think one of the things we wanted to basically do was how do we get, you know, to establish both Hyderabad and Telangana to be the center of innovation, right? Uh, because we do believe very strongly that entrepreneurship is a given uh, entrepreneurship is a given both from a social impact perspective from an economic value add perspective and entrepreneurship is what drives 
innovation. So Hyderabad brings you know, together a confluence of many, many interesting factors. So Hyderabad has a really well-developed education system. We have some of the best higher institutes of learning in, in the country. In Hyderabad, we have ISB, IIIT, the National Law School, and several other high-quality institutions. Uh, we have 41 research labs in Hyderabad, range of sectors, agri-tech, defense, uh, the National Institute of Nutrition, Center for Molecular Biology, uh, the uh, Institute of Chemical Technology, etc. So we have we have academia, we have industry, we have a very proactive government, and we do believe that. Uh, and uh, it's fair to say, uh, you know, that we probably have, uh, you know, uh, we have the best quality of living of any major Indian city. We've been ranked by Mercer for the last five years as the you know, best quality city to live in, in in India, right? So taking all of that into account, uh, and also given you know what's happened with uh, what's happened with COVID, we've seen a lot of innovation being driven, particularly in the ed tech sector. And I'll be happy to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, obviously, we have you know India's the digital adoption has accelerated big time during the during COVID. Uh, we have we are adding close to we added close to 50 million internet users just in the last in, the in, in Hyderabad month. alone in, in India right and ah. we think of our charter being not just Hyderabad but across India right so, so I'm coming can I just jump there. into something to make sure I, I think you said in your opening that it was a public private partnership or something along those lines can you just describe what that looks like in, in real life for people from a Australian context and what that means in India? Sure. So we, you know, so essentially we have uh, four entities which got together, uh, which is basically uh, three academic institutions, which is ah, okay. the Indian School of Business, uh, the International Institute of Information Technology, and the National Law School. So these are the three academic institutions and the government of Telangana, right? So they set up an autonomous body. Uh, so, so I report into a board, right? And we are self-funded. We generate our own own revenues, and of course, we got. Uh, you know, they gave us a seventy thousand square feet building uh, to house. At this point, we have one hundred and sixty startups which work out of uh, our our building, and we support them with access to markets, access to money, access to mentors, access to. Uh, and of course, you know, motivation, and then of course, uh, partnerships. We'll come back to your five M's and one P model that we talked about before. So I'm just going to take a note here, five M and one P, because I want to come back to it. And so what I might do is I might just transition for a moment because I'm hearing that we now have our fourth speaker, Monica Kennedy is with her. So Monica is the Senior Trade and Investment Commissioner based in Mumbai for Austrade. She serves um, she brings extensive experience in international education to the role having previously been Pro Vice Chancellor International at Swinburne University. Hi, Monica. Hi, thanks, David. Great to be here. Um, hi, Melanie. Good to see you as hi. well. And thanks very much for having me along today, David. I'm sorry that I missed the first moments. Uh, would you like some just opening remarks from me, or yeah, like I just would like you to just give us a quick, a brief couple of uh, twenty second introduction to Austrade, please. Sure. I uh, certainly can. So I'm the new Senior Trade and Investment Commissioner for Austrade. Uh, Austrade, or the Australian Government has really um, recently invested in a couple of new senior roles uh, to support international education in the Australia-India relationship and, I, and I'm taking up one of those roles to be based in Mumbai and looking after um, the education sector for Austrade and Australia in, in South Asia. Um, uh, Austrade's role obviously is to facilitate and support the development of Australia-India partnerships and engagement for education and to really ensure that we support uh, the Australia-India relationship in all things that would progress um, education, international education in Australia as well as education partnerships here in India. Fantastic. Um, and, and we were just having, MSR was just giving us an introduction to the Indian startup sector. We'll come back to it in a second, but maybe you can take off from that and give us a little bit of understanding of the macro policy connections between India and Australia and maybe set the scene for our audience around bilateral connections between us, mm -hmm. maybe around the national education policies or maybe ministerial connections. 
Yeah, thanks very much, David, and thanks, and Ms. Sarah came in to listen to some of your remarks um, uh, just in the, the final parts there. I think it's an, uh, an amazing time for Australia and India. Um, our countries are, are, are very, very close. There's a lot of attention from Australia on India at the moment, and you can see it reflected in our bilateral relationships and our bilateral engagements. Our prime ministers have been in contact. Our trade ministers are in contact. Um, we've had both our foreign affairs and our defence ministers in conversations lately too. And certainly from an Australian government point of view, um, India is very much at the centre of our thinking. Most recently, we in Australia released a new international education strategy. And that strategy is one that really um, aligns nicely with the ambitions of India under the new education policy, the opportunity for us to work together on internationalisation, um, on in the increasing autonomy of Indian institutions. And this kind of coupled with the prominence of Indian institutions uh, in the quality of their research and their education outcomes is really giving us great opportunity to engage and particularly in ed tech as um, online education is something that's focal in the new education, uh, sorry. The I, national I might education. jump in there, Monica, and, and bring sure. Malini into the conversation because I think there's a really interesting thing here around how does the NEP set the scene for online learning and collaboration between, say, Australia out of via New South Wales and India. Did you have a, a view on that, Malini? Right. And uh, Monica, thanks. by of course, jump in as well. Of course. <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, I think a few observations. There was a recent report, a study abroad uh, survey uh, called the impact of COVID-19 on study abroad. And I think uh, one of the things it points out too is that about 45.2% of uh, prospective global uh, students are now looking at uh, virtual options for studying abroad. The second thing is uh, specific to India, I think about uh, 1.8 million by 2024 is the number that has been outlined for uh, higher education and students seeking to go abroad. So I think that presents huge opportunity. They will, there will be an uh, expenditure foreseen of about 75 to 85 billion uh, in overseas education. And I think we've seen some good interest in this space as well, picking on uh, some of these stats. So a recent announcement, and I think many of you would have observed this, uh, leveraging on this behavioral change, uh, Upgrad, which is the leading Indian ed tech uh, company, has acquired New South Wales-based uh, global study partners a study abroad uh, company. And they've invested in this company, also investing uh, further to contribute to its growth in Australia and other markets. So I think this is a major trend that I have been observing. Uh, Monica, if you have anything to add? Yeah, specifically, Monica, can I get you to think about what, what the NEP and maybe even international education strategy means for, say, the acceptance of online learning in, in the market? Yeah, I think we saw a, 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 an amazing alignment of stars, if you like, with COVID. You know, we're always looking to find something positive in COVID, aren't we? But while uh, both in Australia and India, there was a, a, a growing uh, prevalence of and capability in online education, um, the, the COVID crisis really accelerated the change. And with the development of uh, new products and experiences online in the education space, um, you can see a real um, swelling in confidence about the product, the credibility of uh, education that's delivered through different modalities, um, really gathered ground. And that's reflected in the national education policy, I think, with the, uh, the explicit interest in developing good quality education um, programs and products out of India. And in Australia too, our institutions were really encouraged to um, develop very quickly uh, good quality uh, good quality education programs that were responsive to the needs of students studying all around the world and this uh, the the confluence of these of, of COVID, um, the national education policy and Australia's international education policy in, in seeking diversity in uh, in modality I think is really pushing ahead a wave of uh, engagement in online, both from a, a platform point of view and from a content, content point of view, and provides lots of opportunities for partners partnership between Australian and Indian institutions and providers. 
a great point, which I think Malini mentioned a moment ago, which is an example being the upgrade and the Global Study Partners mm -hmm. acquisition and partnership. And, and in fact, we've heard from both Elaine Starkey, the CEO, and from um, Kevin Morgan, who is the Chief Operating Officer today in today's program. So it's yes, been yes. a great a great component. Um, MSR, I might come to you for a moment and, and wonder from your vantage point in the startup space, what are you seeing is there, are there people talking about these collaborations between edtech providers? Are we seeing, you've got some academic institutions as um, your founding partners. Are you hearing any desire to build better connections between education providers and online providers, both in India and in, in other parts of the world, including Australia? Sure. Uh, David, thanks. I'm, I'm just going to add a couple of, uh, you know, fact yeah, of course. factoids about uh, what Malini said. Uh, so there are two, three elements from a policy angle, which I think would be useful for the audience to know. One is that uh, uh, there's 100% foreign direct investment now in the education sector, right? So if there is a university, for example, in uh, in Sydney or somewhere in New South Wales, they want to come into India, you can come in, uh, come in on your own and bring in, you know, you don't need a local, uh, local partner uh, from an investment standpoint. Uh, the second is, uh, there's another uh, bill, uh, it's called the National Accreditation Authority Bill for Higher Education and uh, the Foreign Educational Institution Bill, right? So both of these provide access to quality education from across all corners of uh, the globe, right? So I'd really like to encourage institutions uh, in your part of the world to look at you know, India because we have a large, a large market. Uh, the second thing, I think, quickly from the policy standpoint, just to quickly round off that piece, the new policy was launched after a gap of about 34 years. And the whole idea is to democratize uh, education and basically, uh, you know, focuses on technology. And I think a couple of uh, key things, which is, uh, you know, focus on, uh, you know, on, uh, for example, as you know, India is a country with, uh, we have, I think, 22 or 23 official languages. So I think for widespread adoption, if some of the players, you know, uh, provide content uh, from in in multilingual basis, adoption would be would be quicker. So so those are opportunities, and there are plenty of uh, white spaces available. Uh, for example, in upskilling. Uh, so while we have close to you know uh, we have uh, uh, 250 million school-going children. Uh, and about 14 million, uh, you know, 1.4 million schools and 51,000 colleges. There's also a huge opportunity for upskilling, right, of existing professionals. So I think those are opportunities which you know edtech uh, players could could potentially leverage. I I agree with this idea of the upskilling piece. I think it's a really important component because education is not just formal school universities or vocational training there's an entire area and, and i've been arguing for a while there's a bit of a land grab between ed tech and recruitment tech and skills tech and learning tech what we're seeing now and the, you, you make a really good point msr and that is i remember meeting with nascom which is the peak technology player in india i'm going to say well it was obviously pre pre-pandemic um, pre so it must have been in 2019 and I remember meeting the executive vice president of teaching and learning and, you know, on, on continuing professional development. And he made the statement that there are three to four million developers in Bangalore alone that need to be reskilled into new technologies. And that's a really interesting opportunity for partnership between Australian education providers, Australian edtech um, uh, providers and also Indian delivery pet partners. So it's a really fascinating area, this whole idea of upskilling and reskilling, and I'm sure the pandemic will bring part of it. I might use that as a really nice segue to come to you, Malini, to think about New South Wales startup, the edtech sector. So maybe we can deep dive into the New South Wales context and hear about some of the great initiatives driving the startup sector connections um, to exciting markets like India. Right, David. Uh, so, as you know, New South Wales is the tech space. And uh, as far as international education is concerned, New South Wales' largest service export is education. And in the overall uh, international export list, education is the second most. If I look at the number of startups coming out of Sydney in the ed tech space, it's about 130 plus. 
and uh, also the funding is to the tune of uh, in excess of us dollar 15 million uh, as on 2017 so in terms of you know the edtech ecosystem it's a very strong one uh, that new south wales uh, has uh, we have a very strong precinct uh, technologies pre precinct called tech central which offers uh, ample opportunities for uh, international companies to set up their businesses use australia as a test bed and using new south wales as a gateway to australia and the new zealand markets and of course the nearby markets we have our own outreach program called the going global program which also is uh, not just tech but focused on other sectors but okay primarily tech and as you can see this uh, whole edtech uh, cohort of companies this is something we've done for the first time uh, for india uh, this again is focused on education technology we've heard from some of the companies today they have virtually showcased some of their solutions so what we've done uh, in this particular program is that we are trying to actually bring <clears throat> best of edtech innovative solutions to the indian audience for them to explore commercial engagements and uh, better service for the indian industry so new south wales government is actually supporting uh, specific businesses in this space be it in the education training learning and development tech space um while they are helping them grow their businesses uh, in international markets like india but also these companies have a clear value proposition for selling uh, which is very relevant to the indian market they of course have a proven capability uh, established customer base proven technology so that is something that you know you can rely on and clearly defined business models be it b2b b2c or b2b to c uh now you would have heard i don't know if you've joined the program uh, from the morning 10:30 india time a number of companies uh, pitched and some of them offer really fantastic solutions just to quote a few uh, you may have heard from wand who have built a api layer that connects edtech providers to large education systems another one that i was i really think is need of the hour is health stuffed which is a b2b company delivering the best in uh, current relevant and interactive e learning to which connects back to that that, that reskilling thing and upskilling thing we were just talking about a moment ago mm, yes absolutely in fact david on your point about the uh, upskilling piece as well uh, and I, since i love the technology space and i've done a lot of work with the it companies and the indian it companies they often used to say that there's not enough it talent in australia and uh, there's a recent news that the new south wales premier it's just Uh, hot off his desk, and I sent it to all the IT majors, and he's announced a program, a bespoke program, you know, uh, including uh, some of the universities like Macquarie, and I think Microsoft is involved, where uh, you know training in advanced IT will be available. So it doesn't have to follow a particular masters or a post graduation program. It's a very uh, bespoke type of training to make the workforce IT ready. so i think that is something innovative that is coming out of new south wales and good i remembered on your point of reskilling yeah yeah absolutely no 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 we 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 hit the bud we hit the the press releases for the premier everyone's very happy so so we tick that box that's fantastic um what i might do is we might um i might come to you monica in um msr to just think a little bit about connections between india and australia via new south wales so it seems like a great time to think about how do we foster connections between these two great economies and um maybe you might want to give us an idea msr about the relationship that you have between government and industry and how do they connect and what sort of things are you doing to to accelerate that reach sure uh, thanks so uh, thanks david so so in uh, telangana uh, basically we have uh, there's a sister entity we work with very closely Uh, which is called task the telangana academy of uh, skills and education uh, and uh, this works with uh, schools uh, with, uh, you know pretty much the entire spectrum of the schooling system both uh, government schools private schools uh, as well as uh, you know uh, other schools which have been set up and uh, so they are you know one of the challenges in india as you know is how do you bridge the gap between education and employability right so they are playing a big role so anyone who's building content which makes uh, a potential uh, you know basically what you call 21st century skills job relevant skills and also you know skills around communication collaboration creativity critical thinking and so on so we'll be happy to help set up those connections and uh, they are now for example i just uh, you know 
just got out of a meeting where uh, one of the things we are working on is to how do we establish uh, you know telangana as the place to go to from a banking and financial services perspective right so if there are content providers who have content which is relevant to banking and financial services we'll be happy to help them make the connection fantastic ms i'll 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 come back to you with how we can make your state the center of edtech innovation in uh, india as well I'll, I'll i'll be happy to have that conversation with you and monica i might go to you with your sort of final word from this uh, panel thinking about connections between our economies and um, leave you to sort of give us an idea of what you're seeing as an opportunity for australian edtech companies to partner with indian providers yeah, thanks, David. It's um, uh, it is a time of opportunity, and and um, we in Australia are working uh, really hard to make sure that in our in our range of priorities, ed tech is absolutely front and centre. There are uh, a number of opportunities for us to work together that are quite tangible, um, and certainly we're working with a number of New South Wales uh, education providers to connect with India and to develop the relationships further. If I could say that there's three three areas that we'd be really focused on supporting Australian and Indian institutions in collaboration. The first is really about content delivery and the opportunity for um, blended learning. This, um, this opportunity is one that brings the very best of Australia's quality in uh, education. We, we do have a world leading uh, education system. So content delivery for blended learning delivery, um, technology integration. So working with uh, Australian institutions, working with Indian ed tech partners to deliver existing products or to um, co-design new programs for study um, online in India. And then again, in executive programs, we've heard a lot about this at the moment uh, during this discussion today. And I think there's an important opportunity for expansion in executive and, and, and uh, top up education somebody's calling you to that's that's a good way for me to segue into that actually brings us to time that was probably one of the delegates saying you're one minute over we we'll get off the stage i've got to go i've got to pick up the kids sure from school so um, monica malini msr thank you so very much for giving us some insights to the policy settings that's connecting our economies and more importantly around the education technology and education landscape. So thank you very much for your time and your contribution. It's been fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, David. I'd like to repeat uh, David's thanks to uh, Monica Kennedy, um, MSR and Malini Dutt as well for your fantastic insights and uh, what a fantastic way to finish what has been a, a uh, incredible program. Um, I would like to uh, uh, thank all of the companies as well who have uh, showcased their solutions today. Again, if you want to connect with companies directly, um, you can still visit their expo booths. Uh, the booths will be live for another couple of hours. So uh, even if uh, the team members aren't there, you can click the register interest button uh, in their expo booth to, uh, to connect directly with, uh, with team members soon. Um, and again, I would like to thank our uh, partners for this program, especially Investment New South Wales for their, their ongoing support and for making uh, this program and the Going Global EdTech to India program possible. Um, and I'd also like to thank our in-country partners, IDA, uh, for their incredible support as well. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>